Members of Council, members of staff, welcome back. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, members of the public. Happy New Year, Harry. Um, before we get to the approval of agenda, I would uh, just like to say a few words um, to remember uh, our City Council in the, in the south of us, uh, Mayor, or, uh, Jim Tovey. We are saddened to hear the sudden passing of Jim, Council Ward 1 and 2. He represented Ward 1, sorry, um, residents in Mississauga City Council as well as the region of Peel. Uh, Council Tovey was elected in 2010. Some of Jim, Jim was very instrumental in the uh, lakefront property, the uh, project now known as Inspiration Lakeview. Um, he'll be sadly missed. You'll notice the flags at uh, Brampton facilities will be flown at half-mast until sunset the day of Toby's funeral. Also, I would like to uh, um, bring um, attention to the passing of uh, Michael Rooney, the father of uh, Mayor Linda Jeffrey. Uh, we also remember the passing last week of <coughs> Michael Rooney, father of Mayor Linda Jeffrey. Michael was a member of the RCAF Central Band in Ottawa from 1961 to 1968. He was also a teacher for 18 years with the Toronto District Separate School Board at Michael Power St. Joseph High School Music Department. A celebration of Michael's life will be held on January 21st, 2018 from 2 p.m. at the North Bramley Church. Could we all maybe rise and have a moment of silence? Okay, under the approval of the agenda, um, I do have Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question. I don't think it's uh, need for discussion, but on economic development, on the um, changes in policing policy for events. So if, if, if you give me the latitude to ask that question, if we need to have more discussion on we can always add it at the time, but I don't, I don't think we need to. I just want to ask staff whether they know about the policy. We're dealing with the same issue at the Region Appeal, too. Right? Yeah. Want to add it? Got it. Yeah. Okay, okay, so there you go. That's why I asked now. Okay. We add that then um, under, I guess it would be, eight, more quick and tell me, 8.2, I guess, under economic development? 8.3.1. 8.3.1. 8.3.1? Okay. Thank you. I would like to also add, Peter, uh, an item under uh, 7.3.2 uh, under the Corporate Service New Business in regards to the dog bylaw. It's just more for discussion uh, for a report coming back. 7.3.2. So, no, seeing nobody else, could I get a motion to, or, uh, to approve the agenda? Councilor Gibson, or Councilor Gibson, Gibson, all in favor? Thank you, that's carried. Under the Declaration of Interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, does anybody have any conflicts of interest? Councilor Miles. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to declare a conflict of interest on item 13.3 of the in-camera agenda as my husband worked for the organization. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Under the consent, the following items are with an asterisk are considered to be routine and non-controversial by the committee and will be approved at this time. There are no separate discussions on any of these items unless a committee member requests it, in which case it, the item will be considered to and will be considered in the normal sequence of the agenda. Councillor Pleshi. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to pull 7.2.4 from the consent agenda. Okay, could I get a approval of the consent? Thank you. That carried. Announcements. Do we have any announcements today, Peter? No announcements today? Okay, delegations. Uh, we have a possible delegation for a surplus of declaration of an exchange of property with Emerald Waste uh, from Emerald Waste and Inc. Ward 7. That's item 7.2.3. Um, is there any delegations? John, do you want to speak? No? Could we bring that forward then to deal with it now so that the member that's from Emerald Waste can leave if he chose so to. So we'll bring 7.2.3 forward. Is there anybody that wants to discuss it? No? Can I get a, one of the area councillors like to have a little bit? Okay, all in favor? Thanks, that's carried. Thanks, sir. Under 5.2, we have delegate, delegations from representatives of Regeneration Outreach Community, Reprovisions, of supportive affordable housing for the homeless 
and, near, and nearly homeless of Brampton. We have Ted Brown, Executive Director here, Naran, sorry about the last name, House, Chair of Housing Committee, Member of Board of Directors, and Rod Rice, Board of Directors. Is somebody going to... And Council Plessy, you'll chair this. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Willens. Uh, so we have Ted Brown first. You're not Ted uh, Brown. I'm Rod Rice. I know who you are, but you're not. And then Ted will come up and really. So we have a, we have an order. Are <laughs> we? Is everybody okay to change the order? Yeah. Okay. Is Ted Brown here? He is. Yes. And he doesn't want to go first. <laughs> I'm sure he does. He'd rather speak than me. I'm sure. But. <laughs> So thanks for your indulgence, uh, Mr. Chair and members of committee. Uh, my name is Rod Rice. I'm the chair of Regeneration Outreach Community, a not-for-profit Christian organization who works with the most vulnerable people in the downtown uh, core. We're here to talk with you about prov provision of housing for, uh, for the homeless and nearly homeless. And while we know that that's a regional uh, matter, it is also a city matter, and it's that reason why we come to you first. We are seeking support with respect to the provision of land upon which we could build a, a, a facility that we've been working on for some time. Mr. Chair, we may need more than five minutes. I wonder if, uh, with your indulgence, if we could... I'll, um, <clears throat> is everybody okay with that? Moved by Councillor Moore. All in favor? That carries. All right, good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm going to introduce to you uh, other members of the board who would be available for Q&A afterwards who are also on my housing committee. There's Nick Foster, Niran Kulathungam, and, and Ted Brown, who is our executive uh, director, who will be speaking very shortly. Uh, we are seeking the support of, of council for uh, provision of land, as I said, to provide supportive housing for some of the most need needy people in Brampton. I'm going to ask Ted Brown to pick up the ball here and tell you a little bit about us. Thank you. Thank you, Rod, and thank you for this opportunity to come uh, the, this morning. Um, just a little bit about regeneration. We are open 365 days a year. Last year, we served over 57,000 meals uh, right here in the downtown core. Um, one of the things that happens around those meals is a lot of conversation. Part of those conversations that took place uh, around the meal and around some of the programming that we run is, is constantly being reminded of the, of the need for affordable housing here in the city. I want to talk just briefly about Dale. Dale's the old guy in the in the middle. This is some of our staff and students that that have uh, that are with us. He's a senior that's been struggling uh, to find a place called home. Last summer, he ended up in the emergency department at the hospital three times with critical issues in his feet. The first time he went in, he was given antibiotics and cream and told to go home and put his feet up. The third time uh, to emergency emergency, he was finally admitted to get the health care that he needed. He was finally released to wander the streets again. I think that this is unacceptable in a great city like Brampton. This critical need is discussed on the Region of Peel's website under Advocating for Peel. Here are some of the key points from the website. There is a severe shortage of affordable housing in Peel, which Brampton is a part of, and has created the longest wait list for subsidized housing in Ontario, over 14,000 households. A family without priority status moving into affordable housing in Peel today has typically waited for over 12 years for that placement. It is possible for someone on Peel's wait list to wait up to 21 years before receiving a placement in affordable housing. That's right from the Region of Peel's own website. Regeneration intends to be part of the solution in providing housing to those within need within our community. The existing stock of housing available to our guests is in short supply and much of it is, is substandard as well. We all know about the substandard rooming houses that are around that uh, none of us would like to live in. In addition, many of our guests are in homeless situation which they do not have a place to call their own. They live in cars, they sleep in the woods or under bridges. Some crash on other people's floors. This is an unacceptable way for people to live in our great city. Jimmy's another uh, Another individual. Oh. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Oh. Wrong. Let me just go to Jimmy. 
Jimmy is another individual who experienced homelessness. He was on a wait list for over 17 years waiting for affordable housing. Jimmy is on ODSP or Ontario Disability. He is not without his challenges. When he finally did get housing, there was a lack of support to set him up for success. It would be four months that he lived in an apartment before we found out that he didn't even have a bed or furniture or cooking utensils. This lack of support in our city is unacceptable. We're proposing the construction of 20 new bachelor style apartments for individuals in need. This is a small way, and I'll say a small way, that we can be part of the solution. The housing would be created in such a way that individuals have the ability to have privacy with a small living space, kitchenette, private bathroom, and shower. This housing would be properly furnished when they move in. The housing would also include an area in which regeneration can provide supportive programming within the home as well as office space. The model which we are proposing could be replicated to address the incredible demand within our city. Zoltan, go back, uh, Zoltan, who is an immigrant to our country, is also an individual who experienced long bouts of homelessness. It was during one of these bouts that he ended up in a hospital emergency room with extreme leg pain. We called an ambulance for him. He was released without any treatment. It would be about a week later that he collapsed on Union Street, which is just right by the Y, unable to move. He was taken by ambulance to the hospital. It was there that they found infection in his legs and they ended up amputating one of them. It was through our advocacy work as well as the outreach nurse from OW that we were able to get him outfitted with a prosthetic leg. They were not going to do it because he was homeless. He has lived in a few places over the past few years since losing his leg, but all of them have been substandard conditions. Again, this is unacceptable within our amazing city. Mahatma Gandhi said the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. I currently sit on a, on a new committee with Peel Regional Police that's attempting to address some of the issues that occur in the downtown core. Addiction and mental health issues are the sources of many of these problems. Adding immeasurable complexity to these problems is the lack of affordable housing. We as residents of the city do not have the luxury of passing the homeless problem onto the region, the province, and the federal government. No homelessness is as much a part of Brampton as housing, business, government, education, arts, and sports. We are a community of all these components, including, sadly, the homeless. Therefore, the community of Brampton, including its government, has before it challenges of addressing homelessness. We have a crisis in regard to housing for our most vulnerable. We have a 3% occupancy or vacancy rate in the region. This issue is even more critical with legal rooming houses for rent and bachelor style apartments. The cost of inaction is immeasurable. The Peel Alliance to End Homelessness inter uh, interviewed a number of our guests in 2016 as part of a 20,000 home survey across the country. The results, 40% of our guests were deemed to be chronically homeless, meaning that they had spent at least six months of the previous year in a homeless state. 29% had, had spent time in jail the previous six months. What is the cost, the financial and social cost to the community of these statistics? The cost to house someone in provincial jail for one month alone is $6,450, which is born at our expense. 44% 40 of the respondents during the same period had visited the hospital emergency room an average of 3.5 times. The cost per person, $2,163 without the cost of a doctor or any additional tests. 27% of the respondents also used ambulances three times to get to the hospital at an approximate cost of anywhere from $750 to $1,500. This does not include the cost of fire and police involvement in these situations. Stable housing will go to helping reduce these ever-increasing costs. Jill's story is also, uh, is also quite heart-wrenching. Many see her as nothing but a drug addict. She's the one in the middle. She has slept on the doorway of 164 Main Street North. Many of you are familiar with that, that has now been shut down. She has slept on the train tracks by Railroad Street. Her father was murdered as a, when she was a child. Her two, 
Her two children were removed from custody when they were babies. She has cried every day for 16 years because she has been unable to see them. The most consistent housing that she has had has been Vanier Center for Women. Martin Luther King is quoted as saying, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. In this city that I have lived in for over 35 years, er, 34 years, and my wife who has lived here for over 50, I am asking you not to remain silent on the issues of homelessness. We're requesting that you today would direct staff to look for surplus land here in the city of Brampton that may be repurposed for this very cause. We're asking you to do that with a bit of a timeline of three months, which might be pie in the sky, but we've got to have a timeline. We're hoping that this space may be available near the downtown or along transit routes. We are suggesting that these, this space be within the boundaries of Williams Parkway in the north, McLaughlin in the west, Hanson to the east, and parallel to Nanwood in the south. The individuals that would be housed would continue to need ongoing support to help them become successful individuals with the within the community. This support will be accomplished with the ongoing partnerships that Regeneration has with Canadian Mental Health Association, Outreach Team of Ontario Works, Addiction Workers, Peel Regional Police and others. We believe that the government and private funding is available to both uh, to help us with both the building of this project as well as ongoing support that will be needed. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, I do have the uh, President of Peel Living on the board. There's a couple of councillors prior to her, so I'll, uh, I'll go to Councillor Gibson first. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As we know, when we have a delegation in front of us and we don't um, have a staff report, our policy is to refer the issue back to staff. So that's what I'd like to do with some direction, I think. Um, I think we all know that Regeneration does some great work. So if we can refer um, the issue back to staff and ask staff to work with the Region Appeal, because Region Appeal works very closely with Regeneration and the good work they do too, and to see if there's ways that um, we can help as, uh, as a municipality. And I'd also like them to, uh, like staff to see if there's ways that we can help Regeneration with their um, breakfast program that they do at, at Grace Church. Because you do a tremendous job um, helping those, these folks out with your breakfast program too. So those are two different, I know they're two different things, different than what you're really asking for, but the first one is to work with you. And it may be timely for our staff as we deal with, uh, you know, the lands that we have, surplus lands that we have, maybe a timely, um, good timing type of thing to deal with you now and that. So basically it's a referral. I know we're not supposed to speak as I just did, and we have a whole bunch of other speakers too, but I, I want to be clear in what the direction would be to work with them and work with the region of people. We can't isolate this. We've got to work together if we're ever going to solve that. And, and I want to thank you for uh, meeting with Councilor Moore and I the other day and explaining a lot of the stuff and a lot of the issues that you're dealing with and what you're really asking us to try to help do. Thank you. So it's referral. Okay, and just, just in that regard, I'd love to invite council to come out and serve breakfast one morning. Well, we did, we had done that years ago. We did, some of us did do that, so maybe some of the new ones. Let's do it again. There you go. Um, I'm, yes, I'm okay with your referral and, and direction. I'm, I'm just going to ask you to. <laughs> Sorry. I'm glad you are okay with it. I'm just going to ask you to hold it, just because there's other councillors. Well, they can still speak. Out. It's not a deferral. It's a deferral. Right. You can't but speak. they would have they to. Still... They would have to speak to the referral. So I'm going to ask you just to hold the referral. I have it. Well, I don't want to hold the referral because that's our policy, and that'd be breaking our own policy. So okay. they, can, they can still speak to the referral and still speak like I just did. I think. Yes, absolutely. They can speak to the referral. Councillor Madero Thank speaking you. to the referral. For the chair, uh, thank you again, uh, um, Mr. Brown, and everyone else who, who's here. Um, I, I will say that, and you know, I've made comments before. When we look at our our downtown revitalization project in our our uh, university, um, you know, one of the comments I've always made is that you know there are folks um, there who, who I guess are vulnerable folks, exactly folks that you're talking about. And I see this not just uh, a strategy, um, you know, coupled with trying to find affordable housing, but I do find that as part of our downtown strategy. You know, there's an alignment there because we shouldn't just be displacing them and, and revitalizing our downtown. Is how do we handle it? And I think we can couple that 
uh, with that work. I also just uh, public also like to uh, give credit to staff because I can tell you over the last year, year and a half, I have worked with Al in trying to identify surplus lands and we've gone back and forth. Um, so it's great that at least there's a direction here now to take another crack at it, look at what we do. But, uh, you know, I can tell you uh, staff have really uh, um, looked at uh, possibilities already. So I think this will just be a continuation. And uh, I just thank you very much um, for that passion and what you're doing for the city because really it is about uh, city building. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Medeiros. Uh, Councilor Miles. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I don't know whether to applaud or to cry. <laughs> I mean, what what... A sad story and I live in the downtown and I I do experience um, each and every day um, the kind of hopeless situation that that so many people in the downtown um, face so I do want to applaud um, you all of you at regeneration um, for your your very large heart and for the work that you um, you are doing in, in the downtown and the compassion that you show to these individuals because that's not an easy job. Um, what you have, what you are proposing and taking on is an even bigger job and a, and a much greater commitment. There's only way, one way that this is going to be successful and that is if it's a collaboration. Mm -hmm. So collaboration of the community, the city of Brampton, and the region of Peel, and then obviously the support of all the different agencies that you're already doing work with. So I think the beauty of this is, is that you are well positioned right now with your networks and with the people that you're working with to be successful. Um, Councillor Medeiros is the Chair of Human Services at the Region of Peel, so housing and ho homelessness falls under that. Um, I'm the President of, of Peel Living, um, and I will bend over backwards to do whatever, whatever I can personally to assist with this, but if you don't have the land, if you don't have the land, if you don't have the space, mm -hmm. it isn't going to go anywhere. Yep. And we all know that. We've had um, a number of RFPs that have come out. The funding is, there are funds coming through on a regular basis from the provincial and the federal government that could be utilized for this with the support of the region. But the dollars and cents will never add up if you don't have the land. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I support your, your request. Um, I think that if we uh, are committed to this, that we can find an appropriate place um, for you. The other thing I want you to know is the City of Brampton have made a commitment to this issue already. Just before Christmas, we did pass a policy to deal with affordable housing because we recognize as a municipality that we do have a role to play in this. So your, and we also as a municipality have on many occasions given land to Habitat for Humanity, again to address the need in the community for, the, the, for affordable housing, for shelter, the very fact that the most basic human need that we have is, is food and shelter. So um, I, I just, I, I want to applaud you. I really want to applaud you for taking this, this on. I know, Ted, you, um, you know, the work that you have done in this, this community is, um, uh, there's, there's no word to describe it other than um, you, you're a truly um, an inspiration to many people. I want to tell you that you're an inspiration to me, and um, and again, this the city needs to step up. You've gone through, I don't know, a process that's nearly two years to get to this stage. You've asked the community, you've done your outreach, you've done your homework. So I think it's time for us as as a city to say, how can we help? And so I'm very very supportive of of the request. 
Okay. Thank you, Councilor Miles. Mayor Jeffrey. Good, good morning to you and your team. And uh, before I begin, I want to say thank you. This is a tough file to talk about. It's a, a tough file to move. And one of the challenges um, I learned when I first became an MPP is sometimes your statistics aren't right because they're hard to measure. So it's a really challenging story to tell. I think some of the census data that's coming forward will help. And certainly a lot of it is um, pretty troubling. What we read in the United Way report, uh, I, I just had uh, the CEO from United Way in my office yesterday with Anita talking about some of the pilots that we can be uh, participating in from a work perspective for youth, but we really didn't talk about housing, but, but it is a huge component of this. You are coming technically for, to the wrong place because it's the region's job to do housing. You came to exactly the right place, in my opinion, because it isn't the staff that decide how this happens. You need political will around the table here at the region, uh, in Mississauga, in Caledon, because you know what? Homelessness knows no boundaries. And uh, I have the pleasure of sitting uh, at the big city mayors, uh, and we talk with mayors from across Canada about some great programs that they have. I have some materials that I'm going to go and look for that I thought were such clever ideas to, because uh, this isn't one project. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you have one project, and I love that it's ambitious, but we need a lot of projects, mm -hmm. really, in order to make any kind of difference in people's lives and to give people hope. Uh, I love that Hub Habitat for Humanity comes and they've done an extraordinary job and they've been consistent, but it's, I feel like it's a drip, drip, drip of housing and it's, I need, I'm impatient for it. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, these are people's lives and they're put on hold because they don't have a good place to live. You've demonstrated their health care suffers, their education suffers, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a huge long-term effect on families and the people that love them that cannot be resolved without some form of consistent housing. And I think, you know, we all sit here comfortable that we have a home to go to, but so many people in our families and our friends and our neighborhoods are one paycheck away from being homeless. Mm -hmm. And it's getting harder. We've got lots of people in this community that are spent, have two and three jobs to keep a roof over their head. So I get it. So I'm in. I want to be... Uh, that part of that political will, and I think you're hearing that around this table. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we, would, we do wait till the staff report comes back. That's our policy. That's a good way to, for us to get our homework done. But I would, what I want to say is 22 bachelor apartments is just a start. Mm -hmm. we got to do way more than that. Uh, one of the, the, the stories that some of my colleagues on, on city council don't know this, but the, my regional colleagues know this, we had a group come to us who, um, well, I'll back up. When I became mayor, Shelley White came to see me. We had lunch, and I said, so what is, what's one of the big issues I should work on? And she said, well, you know, there's no shelter for youth anywhere in the city of Brampton. I said, no, 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 you must be wrong. Of course, there's, there's a place. There's all kinds of agencies. No, there's no shelter beds. So I think it was two meetings or three meetings later, I get to the region, and we have two reports on the agenda talking about how we're going to study more youth homelessness. I was like, so why don't we just take those bucks and put it into something where people can actually live and have a roof over their head? Mm -hmm. I thought David Schwerk was going to have a heart attack at the meeting. But we did it. We did it as a regional council. We said, let's move it along. It took longer than three months. I don't want to get anybody's hopes up. But we have a shelter. It's not ideal, but it's a place. And you know, the staff said to me afterwards, we thought that when we opened the doors, it wouldn't have uptake. It's full. At least the young people who are in crisis, when they're in crisis, they don't have to go to another city while they're managing that crisis. There's more chance of reconciliation, there's more chance of staying in your school district, and there's more chance of you seeing your family and finding a way, or, or even keeping up a part-time job. That's what good cities do. They wrap around and they provide that social service net. I want to be that city. So I'm in. However I can help, let me know. And thank you for coming here. and. Thank you for the work that you do every day. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Councilor Moore. Thank you. Ted, thank you very much. When I think about where regeneration was 15 years ago, it was almost a dirty word in the community. It wasn't particularly well run. They didn't integrate nicely into the community. Um, and so I want to thank you for your leadership. You have really brought regeneration um, leaps and bounds over the past 
uh, number of years. And I've long said that without the faith community and the hard work of individuals like yourself, um, we would be in more distress than we are today uh, as a city. The city does have a huge role to play. We're responsible for planning. And we have development partners out in the community that um, we could maybe strong arm a little bit uh, more than we have in the past uh, to address these kinds of housing needs <coughs> in the community as well. When we met uh, the other day, we talked about a couple of potential sites and uh, Councillor Gibson and I will, you know, I'm sure other councillors as well, will work with staff to sort of find those little pockets uh, around our community. This is not, you know, I like the idea of a 20 unit. Uh, Sheard Avenue was built, I think it's 26 units. Um, it can, a, a building of that scale can fit nicely into a neighborhood. Um, I think the last thing that we want to do, and that's why I said there's a huge planning component to this, is, you know, have a mega project. Um, because I don't think that that serves the individuals well, and it certainly doesn't serve the neighborhoods that we're trying to integrate and create an empathetic community uh, to those kinds of needs. Um, building the partnerships with sh organizations like SHIP, uh, who've been around the block a few times, uh, is good. Habitat for Humanity, as I said, our development uh, partners as well. The solution, we, we talk about programs. This is, we're, we're past the program piece. We've got that. We understand what the programs look like that support these individuals. This is a bricks and mortar solution. That's where we need to be turning our efforts to now. And so I want to applaud you for coming uh, forward. We'll have the conversation at the region. Um, but uh, I, for one, am really looking forward to the opportunity to work with yourselves, staff, to find those locations in Brampton where we can uh, uh, bring the bricks and mortar solution to this. You know, as a uh, councillor, you're in our ward. Councillor Gibson and I hear the complaints and the concerns about, you know, the, the folks they see hanging around. Well, if you don't have a place to go that has, that doesn't have some social space included in it, and we talked about this as well. It's not just the bachelor apartment. It's the common areas where people can come together and socialize and, and you know, problem solve and commiserate whatever the conversation of the day is. But that is so vitally important. We see these people on our streets because they don't have some place to go. And as you say, with the directions to the patient that showed up at the hospital, go home and put your foot up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Councillor Bowman. Thank you very much through you, Mr. Chair, speaking to the referral. Um, sorry. Ted, thank you very much for coming um, with your group. You do phenomenal work. Um, having been involved with a large number of your programs that go on there, I was completely and utterly blown away when we did the gift of giving back with Councillor Fertini and Councillor Willens to find out that 50,000 pounds of food, 25 tons of food lasts about four months mm -hmm. with with your group and that was just uh, astronomical numbers that that the need is so critical to be out there and I would just like to say I fully support this initiative like the mayor I think it should be at least doubled but we'll start where we can um, and anybody who has any questions any doubts that this is a worthy project and should be something that we're all in on go and serve, more importantly, sit down with these people at Regen and talk to them. Mm -hmm. have, a, have a meal with them. And I think you'll come back to Council uh, in, in full support of something like this. So thank you guys very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Council Bowman. CAO Harry Schlein. Thank you, and uh, Council, we'll take that direction. One thing that you can help us with, um, with the sense of urgency at the regional level, staff level as well, We'll be working with uh, them on the 23rd. We have a meeting with uh, our CLT team and theirs. And it would certainly help if you give that direction to regional staff to work with us ASAP on this, to meet those tight timelines. Thank you. Councillor Miles. Mr. Chairman, um, to Ted, are you planning on making this uh, presentation at the region? Yes. Um, when? I'm going to defer to, sorry? Within two months, yeah. Within, can you do it quicker? Yeah. 
my problem is I'm going on vacation the end of the month for a couple of weeks. And <laughs> no way, Kat. Yeah. <laughs> we can oh. add you to the agenda tomorrow. Tomorrow. We don't have region tomorrow. Oh, we don't have region tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing for me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, Councillor Gibson has a solution, so... Over. Councillor Miles, are you done? Yeah, over. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Gibson. Chair, um, can we just direct staff, I guess, for the clerk's department to send, once this resolution, hopefully, I think it will be passed, to send it uh, to the Regional Appeal, and then it would get on our agenda. These folks don't have to be there at that particular time, because I, I know we had talked before they couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. But we can, at that time, once it's on our agenda, then give the direction to the regional staff to work with the city staff, and when their 23rd meeting comes along, they've got that direction anyway. And then these folks can come and do the same presentation in a month, two months, but that won't matter. We're already, we've already working on it. So can I add that direction into that motion, please? Okay, so um, Mr. Fay, can we add that to this referral? Okay. Does anybody, Councilor Miles? up a meeting with the um, with the Commissioner of Human Services and the what's Dan Dan an executive director executive director for pill living and just just have that discussion and tell them let them know that the city is is going to be uh, working and would like to become a partner with the region on this so we could do a little bit of work so we can CC them on this on this referral, and then you guys can go ahead and feel free to set that up with uh, copy the yeah, region and the, the region and, appeal appeal and appeal living. Okay. Does anybody need the referral read out, or is everybody okay? And I, I don't know that if the mayor wanted to be at that meeting. No. Okay. All in favor of the referral? Okay. That carries. Thank you very much for coming. Much Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Quillens, I pass back to you. Thank you very much, Councilor Kaleshi. I'll just wait till these guys uh, clear up before we go to the next delegation. Actually, I'll pass it over to you, Councilor Bowman, because you uh, chair this next delegation. Five points. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, item 5.3. We have a delegation from Kirk Brannan, President Brannan Steel, um, regarding the operational success of Brannan Steel, one of the uh, larger. Oh, and we will also bring forward 8.1.1 uh, from uh, Daryl from Economic Development. He will uh, present a, uh, a report, and then I guess Kirk is going to come up and speak. So thank you very much. Daryl? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Madam Mayor and members of Council. Uh, thank you, this, thank you uh, for this opportunity this morning to provide an update on our work supporting the advanced manufacturing sector here in Brampton. Uh, so before providing an update, I just wanted to introduce or recognize Kirk Brandon, the president of Brandon Steel. After my update, Kirk will give uh, an, an overview of Brandon's 50 years in Brampton, almost 50 years in Brampton, uh, including who they are, uh, how they've changed over the years to remain competitive, and then how we're working together on things like innovation, uh, workforce development, uh, to keep Brampton manufacturing going in the right direction. So I think we're all well aware of the importance of uh, advanced manufacturing <coughs> in Brampton's economy. Strong contributor to GDP. Uh, you'll see up there more than 35,000 people employed uh, nine, oh, through 900 companies. So that's one in every five people, one in every five people in the workforce work in uh, manufacturing. What you'll see there is the major subsectors as well. Uh, I think we're all well aware of automotive, but it's key to remember metal fabrication, aerospace, chemical, these all fun, uh, fall under the idea of advanced manufacturing. Uh, I'm about five months in with the city now, and I, from what I've seen so far, what makes Brampton's advanced manufacturing sector successful is a combination of strong companies, the geographical strengths, uh, as well as our partners and stakeholders. 
So for example, we talk about Sheridan Center for Advanced Manufacturing uh, and Design Technologies. It has 40,000 square feet dedicated to advanced manufacturing. So in that center, there's 18 ABB robots where, where students can train with robotics. Uh, they have various 3D printers that students can use to produce products uh, in, in an innovative area like 3D manufacturing. And then as well, the key to that center is the industry-focused projects where students work with local companies to develop new products, processes, problem-solve issues, uh, all at this center. So they've done at least 50 of these joint uh, public-private projects uh, in the last few years. Uh, Sheridan has also transferred its uh, skilled trade center to here in Brampton, uh, Davis campus last September. So that's another area where there's a lot of activity around training and support. 130,000 square feet this center. Uh, it has machinery, equipment, labs, all of these things are in the skilled trade center. So in addition to the training support, uh, as, as you're all well aware, the location, CN Intermodal, proximity to Pearson Airport, proximity to major highways, these are all things that allow companies here in Brampton access to international domestic customers much more easily than, than other regions. So these factors combined together are why companies like Brandon Steel, Brampton Engineering, Chrysler, uh, ABB Robotics can uh, flourish here in Brampton. So as part of my role as a sector manager for advanced manufacturing, I try and get out and visit local companies. Here's a list of companies that I've seen in the last few months uh, to get a better understanding of their businesses, business development activities, expansion plans, uh, issues they're facing, and then any good news stories that we can keep to promote uh, local business. So all told, these 19 companies represent over 2,300 employees. Uh, the smallest one was 20, the largest was close to 500. So what you can see that they all have different issues based on their size, location, and other things, but there are a couple of themes that continued, uh, came out each time. So the first one is just attempting to improve their businesses, whether it's through innovation, safety initiatives, uh, attempting to enter new markets, all of these things that are necessary to remain competitive. So you just see it over and over, different ways that they're trying to do that. And then the second one, we're in good economic times right now. So the, the issues with labor is sometimes attracting workforce. Whether it's skilled employees, non-skilled employees, it's that the labor pool isn't necessarily. And I think Kirk will, will mention some of his challenges in the, his presentation. So the other part with the site visits as well is talking about uh, marketing these companies where possible, promoting their activities. A uh, couple of examples, so Brandon Steele will be celebrating 50 years in Brampton this year. Uh, as well, Councillors Bowman and Willens and I visited Chromaflow earlier this year. They were also celebrating a 50th anniversary here in Brampton. Uh, it's a small paint <coughs> manufacturing company, 35 employees. And on that visit, we had a good chance to talk about uh, initiatives they're using to recycle water and how that's led to significant savings, uh, talking about them with linking them to Sheridan and apprentices. Uh, and then as well, we talked about their site and if they ever did to expand any support the, the city could provide if they did go ahead with those expansion plans. So I think what, what this is leading to is what, uh, what we're trying to work on for 2018. And if I break it down into two, two central areas, the first is the idea of innovation, uh, and the second is the idea of workforce. So when I say workforce, I mean uh, skilled labor, non-skilled labor, reskilling people as technologies change, uh, experiential learning, making sure that the idea of apprentices and businesses are working uh, and finding opportunities for young, for youth. Uh, and then as well on the side of innovation, just working with companies as they talk about innovation, whether it's a company specific activity or working through the advanced manufacturing super cluster proposal that we, uh, we discussed uh, late last year. So these are just areas that will continue to focus on innovation, uh, investment and workforce throughout 2018. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, I just put this slide up. Sometimes when people hear advanced manufacturing, manufacturing, it's difficult to figure out what the end product is. So I just, the top left-hand corner, uh, Kirk can speak to, but parts that they develop end up on Volvo uh, large, large uh, equipment, and there's some other examples as well. So with that, I'll say thanks, and I'll pass it over to Kirk.
top one or uh, just on the side, or you can use the inner sweater. Okay, perfect. Technology, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> Good morning, Madam Mayor, Mr. Chair, and members of Council. Thank you for having me here today. Many of you have driven by Brand Steel for a number of years. We once backed onto Hart Lake Road, and now it's a very impressive 400 <laughs> series highway known as the 410. And we use it daily to deliver our products throughout Ontario and into the United States. Today I'll take you behind the walls and show you what goes on at Brand and Steel. We started out in 1968 with 3,000 square feet and four employees. Today we are 203,000 square feet and 170 employees. We've been evolving from what we would call a traditional manufacturer to an advanced manufacturer. What does it really mean to be advanced manufacturing? Well, for us, it's using the latest innovative technology to improve our products and our processes. Over 20 years ago, we had one of our key accounts, Volvo, lead us down this path. Only back then, we referred to it as becoming a world-class supplier. Basically, what do we do? We take steel plate, cut shapes, make parts to print through various cutting technologies. These technologies have changed dramatically over the years. Every two to three years, we are having to update our machines to keep ourselves current. Oxyfuel cutting is the oldest technology which uses a combination of oxygen and propane to cut parts up to six inches thick. The only difference today is these machines are fully operate, are automated and computerized. The next technology that came along is called high def plasma cutting. These machines now cut faster with greater tolerances we are cutting up to two inches thick. But what's also great about this technology is the environmental friendly. All these tables have downdraft tables. And as you look up there, all the exhaust the fumes are brought down, they're brought along the top of our building, outside of our building, through a dust collector system. Then during the winter time, the hot air is pumped back into, uh, into our building for a heat recovery system. These machines here you're looking at are laser machines. Once again, latest technology, precision cutting, and also come with heat recovery system for putting heat back into our building during the winter times. It's not just about having the machinery, but it's also being able to differentiate yourself from our competition. What you're looking at here is Ontario's largest laser machine. It's a 14 foot wide, 50 foot long table. There's only three of these in all of Canada. It's allowed us to have a bit of a niche marketplace. We're shipping these parts throughout Canada and into the United States. We've grown our business not just through cutting of parts, but we call value added secondary operations. When Brandon Steel first 30 years in business, we would just cut parts and ship them. Now we go into what we call value added. Uh, and this here is what you're looking at at press break. We have several of these press breaks. This is our latest one we bought two years ago. Most press breaks out there are 15 feet long. This one happens to be 30 feet long and one of the largest press breaks out there, not only just in Ontario, but North America. And really what it helps our customers do is Instead of having to weld two or three pieces together, they're now able to get this part in one massive piece. Machining is another value added process we have under our, our roof. We take simple parts, machine it, and now it's ready to go into uh, full assembly. Ten years ago, we branched out from just cutting raw plate into uh, saw cutting. We're already selling to many of these customers, and as you walk through their operations, not only do we see a steel plate, we also saw a lot of structural shapes. So we branched out, we leased another uh, 75,000 square feet in Arenda in Brampton, and this is where we saw cut a lot of our uh, tubing products. This is an interesting picture, twofold. One, not only does it show another piece of value added machining being plate rolls, but it also is a reminder how fragile our economies are. After our last recession, Prime Minister Harper came to visit Brandon Steel. We utilized a government program called the WorkShare Program which allowed us to retain as many of our employees as possible. Back in 2009, sales plummeted from, two th from sorry, 2008, we were 44 million, and the end of 2009, we we're down to $22 million in sales. The WorkShare program, even though we didn't have the work, we allowed to keep many of our employees and retain them for better time. Since then, uh, we've had a pretty dramatic turnaround since 2010. Uh, we've had a pretty, what happened is our process systems, along with our excellent workforce, has allowed us to grow sales from 22 million back up to 60 million last year. These next few slides really shows the diversification of work at Brand Steel. 
Currently, we're cutting 5,000 steel parts every day and consume 240,000 pounds of steel on a daily basis. We do work for a lot of large OEM manufacturers. What you're looking at here in the front is a bumper for a road grader. Most of you are used to a bumper on a car. Behind there, you're looking at large rolled plates. These rolled plates we use for uh, storage tanks. Uh, we could use uh, Pearson, the fuel tanks for the, uh, all the fuel. IKO in Brampton, who makes the roofing shingles. We've done large storage tanks for these. Uh, we're involved with the nuclear industry. These parts are used for the building of, of nuclear uh, storage tanks. We're pretty diverse. We also do a lot of work for forestry, uh, John Deere in the States, and we do a lot of uh, timberjack, tiger cat, sorry, in Ontario, build forestry equipment. What you're looking at here is a large saw blade. Uh, we take this part, we machine it, we add the carbide teeth. Just to give her a perspective size, it's 60 inch diameter and two inches thick, so a pretty impressive uh, saw blade. Uh, the old days, we used to cut parts and ship it out our door. Now, kind of like automotive, it's all kitted. Uh, this goes to a particular weld cell and is shipped on a just-in-time basis. No longer do the customer have their parts for weeks and months in advance. We are on daily shipping schedules running just-in-time in Kanban systems. Here's an example of where our steel parts end up with. We ship it out and you just see a shape. Here's what uh, a lot of this uh, product goes into. Many people know Magna and Linamar as the suppliers of parts to the automotive industry. We are the parts supplier for the large OEMs. So far I've talked a lot about the uh, machinery, but you also need to have the right people and the right processes. Each one of these customers has their own unique MRP or ERP systems. We are constantly investing money in technology to help improve our processes and training our people. We have spent millions in IT to come up with fully integrated systems, which allows us to track our customer's order throughout our operation. Every day we need to do things even better than before. We've been on a lean journey since 2012 when we hired our first lean Six Sigma manager. Also, several of our employees, including myself, had the privilege of going to Vol with Volvo to Brazil, China, and South Korea, and Hitachi has taken us to Japan to look at best practices around the world and bring them back to Brampton. In closing, Brampton has been a great place for us to call home, and we are very proud to be celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Brampton has provided us with a great cross-section of people to hire from, but is still one of our major concerns going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirk. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Um, we do have uh, Councillor Moore on the board. Is this a question of, uh, of Kirk or of Daryl? Question of Kirk. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you're right, I've probably driven by <coughs> Brandon Steele uh, for 30 years <laughs> and uh, uh, never seen the inside of the facility. It was very impressive. My question is more around the technology that you use to have advanced your manufacturing processes, uh, the, the laser technology, the, the other technologies. Are they um, Canadian technologies or would they be coming from other parts of the world? And the, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, it's more than just the employees that you have in your facility. It's when facilities upgrade and add technologies, are we also adding jobs across the country or across the province? So I'm trying to get a handle sure. on that. Sure. So a lot of the particular equipment and machinery we have are globally developed, really. Uh, really, it's the handling of the steel, the movement of the steel, which is more local. And ABB is a great company where they have the robotics and really trying to partner up with a company like that to try to help us become more efficient. Most of the machines, though, are, are, are built throughout the world throughout from that standpoint. Like the lasers themselves are Italian-made, for example. No, it's so really it's really where they're, where they're made. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Councillor Fortini. Thank you, Fisher. Thank you, Ted. Uh, my one question, on the lasers, do they have the same power to cut through uh, the tempered steel than the regular steel? The same uh, process? Yeah, it, it, it's the same process. There's different gases used for cutting through different steels. We, we're in the carbon steel business. There's aluminum, there's stainless, there's everything. So whatever product you're cutting through, it's just a matter of changing the gases that you cut with. But you still cut uh, tempered steel for blades and stuff? Still yes, you do. And it's, the process is the same? Correct. Okay. Same machinery, basically. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Fortini. Mayor Jeffrey. Thank you for coming. 
and uh, happy anniversary. Thank you. There's a lot of things happening in the world these days that it's making it very difficult for companies to uh, plan ahead. For example, minimum wage. When you've quoted on a contract and then the costs change, that has an impact on your business. Um, artificial intelligence and the customers that you're dealing with who are using more artificial intelligence changes the type of contract that they're likely asking you for. Can you speak to how those changes are um, shaping your business and, and where you see things going in the future? Sure. The uh, minimum wage is very interesting because it's sort of the hot button these days. So we recognize what was changing. Just to give you an example, we have now, our starting wage at Brandon Steel is we moved up to $17 an hour. We moved our shift premium from a dollar to $4 an hour. Recognize we need to have the workforce. That being said, it's obviously increased our cost structure. Some of that we're trying to improve do through our own efficiencies. Some we try to pass on. Passing on cost to anybody, nobody likes to see it. So it's about us becoming, how do we do things more efficient? And they say even better every day. Uh, yeah, technology is changing. And that's why we constantly have to reinvest. And I think before, Brand Steel, we're on an island. We, we sort of look at ourselves. And now I think we need, it's more important for us to reach out, whether it's regional, whether it's government, federal, provincial. Uh, we can't just operate in manufacturing by ourselves, because that's what we've done for a number of years. And manufacturing suffered in Ontario and in Canada. And in order to grow this, we need to sit there and work as a team and not just brand a steel as one island out there. One of the other things that I think all of us are kind of waiting on tender hooks is some of the NAFTA organization conversations that are going on. How, how do you foresee that impacting your business? Uh, NAFTA could be uh, very concerning for us. I mean, we, we are in close contact, whether it's the John Deere, Volvo, Caterpillars. I mean, most of our product ends up across the border, if not with our first touch, on a second touch. Uh, they're very concerned, too, uh, because we don't really know. If, if, if it's traded fairly and freely, steel, all my steel is made, 99% of it is made in North America, so I'd like to think the steel could transfer back and forth. If an unfair tariff gets put on us, it's going to greatly affect our business. So that's, that's our biggest concern. It, it's, it's, this is not rational, what we're experiencing. That's, that's my biggest concern. If it's a business case, I'm okay. You're, you're prepared to compete. Prepared to compete. What can we do to help you? Uh, you know, this is great today. Uh, reaching out with Daryl, working with the super cluster. I'm really, you know, the super cluster has been a great idea. Uh, it's come too fast. It hasn't allowed business to really absorb what it's all about. Uh, this pot of money of 950 million is extreme but we've all had to move fairly quickly and jump aboard. So uh, I just think be there to support us. I mean, Brampton's done a great job for Brand Steel. We're not going anywhere and say we just keep growing, so. I agree with you. The super cluster did come very quickly. It was hard to uh, be prepared and provide the kind of information that was um, funding the, the documents that were going to the federal government. But I think for us, I think our experience has been when we put our application in with Toronto Global with the Amazon bid, it's good practice and it puts us in a good place to have other conversations with other opportunities that will present their... Uh, so my offer to you is if there's something we can, as a city can do to bolster uh, a new client that you're seeking that we can support you in uh, bragging or, or offering support for a visit, uh, I think you know we have a strong economic development department that wants to... Uh, we're hungry. We want to help you. And uh, we appreciate that you've been a business uh, in for 50 years, and we want you to be a business that someday we celebrates 100 years in Brampton. Thank Great. you for coming Thank you. today. Great. Thank you, Mayor Jeffrey. Chair Willens. Thank you, three chairs. Thank you, Kurt, for coming in. Uh, family has been in, business, in Brampton for a long time, as well as the business. And another uh, aspect of your business and your, your family is the uh, contribution to the community. I know your father, he, sat on, he sits on the uh, foundation with me for Pill Memorial Hospital. Without his help, we probably couldn't have raised a lot of that money. So thank you, and thank your dad as well. And thank you, Daryl. Um, the five months you've been here, it's uh, what a change. Um, that call we went with Chromaflow was great. You asked the right questions for those guys, and they're very keen on linking up that partnership with Sheridan. And as I'm sure Brandon Steele and other manufacturing companies in Brampton do, it's important because we had a tour of the manufacturing of the advanced manufacturing and the uh, new facility, new skilled trades, and a lot of those machines you have there, Sheridan actually has their students working on those machines that come from various parts of the globe, 
uh, to train them to get them ready for the workforce right here in Brampton. So thank you very much, and thank you, Darren. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing nobody else on the board, thank you very much for coming in, Kirk. Um, again, I'd like to reiterate that what what you're doing at Brandon is is a great lesson for other manufacturing facilities here in Brampton and everywhere else. You've recognized the need for change. You're now shipping things in in kits rather than you know 40 pieces of one, 40 pieces of another, which is a fantastic idea. Uh, we appreciate you being here in Brampton and uh, and helping grow the city of Brampton. And you certainly are visible. Uh, you know, to anybody, anybody uh, passing by and going over the 410. So congratulations on 50 years. We hope to see you much longer than that uh, around the city of Brampton. And to you, Daryl, also a, a big thank you to you and economic development. This is a prong of economic development strategy where uh, meeting and greeting with local businesses and local manufacturing facilities um, is, is reinforcing relationships with them and it's reinforcing best practices that can be shared amongst all of the, uh, all of the facilities in Brampton. And uh, we, are, we are doing a lot of data mining from the businesses here within Brampton. Um, and I hope that's going to bid uh, very, very well for us going forward. So thank you to Economic Development as well. So thank you very much. Can I have a motion to receive the delegation and the presentation? Uh, Councillor Pileshi, thank you all in favor. That carries. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. I will turn the chair back to Councillor Willens. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. We are now at the section of the meeting with public works and engineering section there are no staff presentations uh, we have three reports here one is in consent uh, we have a report from the manager of open space development public works engineering dated February <coughs> November 14th 2017 request for budget amendment capital project 175860 neighborhood parks Queens Point and Credit View Crossing Chincusi subdivision part park blocks 69 and 12 registered plan 43M, 1996, Ward 4. Are there any questions, or can I get a motion? Move? Oh, was there any questions? Want to move it? Oh, sorry, sorry. Councilor Medeiros moves it. All in favor? That carries. Thank you. The next report is from <coughs> Senior Project Manager of Public Works and Engineering, dated December 15th, 2017. I read the downtown reimagined streetscape tender integration with Region Appeals Downtown Capital Project, Phase 1, Wards 1 and 3. This is a recommendation in Councilor Moore. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to amend uh, number two in the recommendations, just to make it a little bit more clear. The... Um, under the overview, it says that the integrated tender is anticipated to be advertised in July of 2018, but it's not reflected in the recommendation. So um, it really is a, a friendly amendment that uh, on number two to change it to say that the council direct staff to request the regional municipality of Peel to delay the tendering to no later than June the 30th, 2018 of its downtown capital project phase one. So it's really just putting a, a deadline in there for getting it out the door. And that's been acknowledged by staff that this can't continue forever and always that, um, you know, regardless of, of uh, what the outcome is and our ability to respond to what comes out of the, uh, um, the part two uh, decision from the ministry that the regional region will get the, the tender out the door in July. This is just to reflect that. Okay, is everybody clear on that? Staff's all right with that? All in favor? That carries, thank you. Uh, the next one was in Peter, consent. do you need this? Just changing that. The next one's in consent. The next, uh, it's a discussion item at the request of Councillor Gibson, re snow clearing program, call center inquiries and responses. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I added this um, item, and uh, to uh, because we've, I, in our area, have had so many calls on snow removal in the last couple of weeks, and I didn't know whether or not the other members of the council had it. We've always heard that some are getting the same calls that we were getting. Uh, I wanted to um, have an opportunity, and I, I want to first of all, I want to thank staff, both uh, from the public works staff and and the uh, 311 staff for meeting with Councillor Moore and I in the last few days and going over some of the issues that we had had and uh, in particular I want to give a, a, a real shout out to Ken Lupe who has been uh, 
excellent working with our office and, and us when we've had these calls. Um, you know, it didn't matter when I sent emails or our staff sent or Council Moore sent emails. It didn't matter what time of day it was. Ken always come back right away. In fact, I'm sure I got him into bed a couple of times. Um, and, you know, I don't expect any staff to, at, at, at one time, there was, a, I think it was 12.30 or 12.45 at night, uh, I had sent an email and he responded. I don't expect any staff to do that, but that's great customer service. So I hope that the commissioner would pass that on. Um, but there's obviously some issues that I think we have to acknowledge, and I, I wanted to give staff an opportunity to explain what went on what's happened um, during that uh, the last couple of weeks and, and the 311 staff also to explain how that was handled because we did get an awful lot of complaints um, about the 311 too. So I, other than that, I just want the opportunity for staff to uh, give us an overview. Thank you. Um. Through you, Mr. Chair, so so thank you, Councillor Gibson. Um, well, this 2017-18 uh, winter season is basically a typical winter season. We haven't had one for a while. Uh, we haven't had uh, what I would call excessive snow amounts, but we've had more or less average snow amounts up to this point. Um, but what has happened that that's maybe a little different is extreme cold temperatures. We've had back-to-back -back storms, even though they haven't been really uh, uh, intense. Uh, but every time there is a snowfall, we have to, we have to deal with it. We have to treat it. Uh, we've had a lot of cloudy days. Uh, we've had a lot of cold temperatures. We've had very little sunlight. And as I think most of you know, nothing beats uh, snow removal and winter maintenance than warm uh, warm air and and the sun. So and we haven't had a lot of that. Having said that. Um, we have had some instances where, where all of a sudden the weather did, did change. The, the Arctic vortex uh, shifted and all of a sudden we got uh, warm air come in and, and especially in our residential streets. Um, where we strive to make all streets safe and passable, we obviously try and get things down to bare pavement on our collectors and arterials. But the residentials are, are different. Um, because after we do our collectors and, and, and uh, our arterials, then we move into the residential streets. Well, by the time we get into the residential streets, residents usually have gone somewhere. They've gone out of their driveway, they've drive, driven down the street and got onto a collector or arterial. But, but by them actually going and getting out on a residential street, it packs down the snow. So by the time we get there, even though we plow it, uh, we don't get all of it because there's already it's hard packed snow on 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 the road. We treat it, we make it passable, and unfortunately, um, the second week of January, we well, unfortunately for us, uh, the, the the temperature actually rose fairly dramatically, and all that hard packed snow uh, melted. And when it melted, it melted kind of all at once, and it all became slush. So it's so we were doing okay until the temperature rose and it rose dramatically. And then we got a number of calls for that. Um, you know, we sat down and under Councillor Gibson's urging, we sat down and, and actually re-examined uh, our, our messaging that we do with 311. And we found, quite frankly, that we had a gap. I mean, we've got, a, we've got levels of service and, and that's what we tell residents. But in the case where uh, hard packed snow all of a sudden melts, uh, we go back and we deal with it but it's not in any script in, in 311. So that's something that, that, that we're dealing with. And there's a number of other things. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, I'm going to let uh, Michelle Solsky maybe tell you a little bit more about 311 and how it works and uh, what we've been doing so far and what we're going to be doing differently. Joe, before, if I can, Mr. Chair, before Michelle starts, can you explain, um, because there were some streets that were missed. We deal with contractors, I don't know words you mouth. We, we have issues with contractors at times, we, we, we know that. But there were some um, streets that were missed. We have to acknowledge that, that that, that did happen. Um, not just in this snowfall, but in the last. Can you explain what, um, what we're doing to try to correct that, to make sure that those type of issues don't happen again? Through, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, we take our levels of service very seriously. So. When a street is missed, and it could be due to a number of reasons, uh, there could be a mechanical failure, the the the, uh, the piece of equipment that's doing their route, 
might be part way through the route, they have, they have an issue, they go back uh, to get fixed. Uh, another machine comes in to take over the route, it's not really familiar, and that happens. Um, very rarely the, does somebody who has a route just misses the street. Having said that, though, um, uh, this municipality, Brampton, uh, we've, just, we've actually just signed the contract on the 31st of December, and we're going to be installing in all of our vehicles an automatic vehicle locator system so that we'll be able to look on a screen to see where the, where the, uh, where the equipment was, whether the plow was up, whether the plow was down, whether the spinner was moving, so we can actually see are they salting or are they, or are they actually plowing. So we hope to have that fully running, internally, internal facing uh, by the end of this year, by the end of this winter season. And with a little bit of luck and with a little bit of help from IT, uh, we actually hope to get this thing uh, out to the public so the public can actually dial in and see where the plow is, where, where it is on the route, and, and they can actually then exp they can then make their own determination as to when they can realistically expect the plow to come to their street. <coughs> So that's something that we're working Great. on. That, that's what I was looking for you to explain. Thank you very much. Okay. Michelle, Michelle. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't know who was going next. So uh, thank you. So through the chair, uh, thank you for letting us have this opportunity to speak to council today and um, just kind of go through a series of events that have happened since, I'll say December 22nd is when the first weather event happened. Um, so we work really closely with the road operations group um, and it starts long before weather event. So uh, prior, so I'll say you know, months before winter sets in, we do meet with the operations group and we do review our scripting and our messaging and the service level and our processes so that we have all the up-to-date information and documentation for our CSAs. Obviously, we want to equip them with the best tools, um, whether it be through technology or messaging, um, for them to, to advise the residents. Um, just put in context some of um, the stats. So since December 22nd, uh, the contact center has taken over 30,000 calls. 2,300 of those are related to snow. Um, of that number, over uh, about 1,400 of those were information only. So those were people that were calling in during that weather event. So it's snowing. Um, operation says that, you know, the snow will be cleared within 24 hours. Those people are calling during the event. So during that time, we're educating the caller. We're still logging it as a service request so that it can go back to the yards. Uh, but we're educating them on what that service level is. So depending on what the operating department has messaged to 311, uh, we relay that. Um, about over 800 of those came after events or were urgent situations such as, you know, a sight line um, to a road uh, due to a snow bank or an icy road, uh, anything that's deemed urgent. Um, so in the context, it was about 7% of our overall call volume. Um, as um, Commissioner Petrushka said, we, through this and through the different weather, I'll say the, the warming up and the cooling back down, we did, we did identify some gaps in our communication. So communication that was, works was doing, coming back to the 311 folks. So um, we actually are meeting and uh, doing a facilitated workshop next week so we can uh, get these processes down and get the correct messaging out, you know, hopefully before the next weather event. So hopefully one's not till the following weekend. Um, so we work really hard on, on ensuring that we're educating our uh, residents. Sometimes, you know, they don't necessarily like what they're hearing, um, but at the end of the day, we're still logging all their calls um, for action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Council Dillon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, First off, I just want to thank Joe, you and the whole team. I know Ken has been extremely busy, uh, Franco as well. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely, and I want to thank uh, Councillor Gibson for adding it to the agenda as well. Uh, uh, I thought it was just my area, but uh, the more and more I spoke to uh, different councillors, you know, it's absolutely citywide. Uh, and, and so, you know, you know, this is the my third, I think, this is my third winter, and you know, I obviously thought, you know, there's a there's a great uptick as well. Um, 
A question, I have a couple questions. Um, has staff, so you, you know, is there a particular reason why there's so many, um, perhaps you did answer it, but is there a particular reason that you've identified why there are so many more calls this year uh, as opposed to um, uh, as, as opposed to previous years, and I know you mentioned that there's a, you know, Arctic vortex, and that uh, uh, you know there was a back-to-back -back, uh, uh, storms. But uh, is that uh, uncommon, or is that something common you've seen before, or is this something that uh, um, you know you haven't seen in a while? Well, three, Mr. Chair. Well, we've seen back-to-back -back storms, but uh, first of all, the winter season really got underway at a at a particularly uh, delicate time right through the Christmas season. So the first snowfall was basically on the 22nd of, uh, of December, and then it was back to back, and then it was Christmas, and people are visiting people out on streets. So we purposely stayed off of residential streets uh, uh, for an extra day uh, because of parked cars, and so that, that added to, to a little bit of frustration uh, right, off, right off the bat. But, but the extreme temperatures, I think, and the fact that we've, we're getting these back-to-back -back storms, so the level of service is to clear all streets in 24 hours, unless it's a back-to-back -back storm. Well, then that's extended to 48 hours. So, so we stay on those collectors and arterials most of the time until they're in, 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 in shape that we can get into the residential streets, so things get prolonged. And, uh, and uh, you know, and that's, that's when the residents get frustrated, when they look out the window and nothing's been done for a while. Right. Can, can the service levels be, anything be attributed to perhaps even um, uh, the fact that we have a, a new contractor? Uh, is, was there, have they acknowledged uh, or have you identified any errors on their part? Like, for example, we mentioned the streets because there's a number of calls that I've had where, you know, they've kind of, uh, cut corners, particularly in some of the uh, the cul-de-sacs, uh, where it wasn't done uh, correctly, and they kind of built. Uh, there's windrows, but uh, uh, there's uh, you know they built up walls that regularly wouldn't have been uh, been there uh, of snow. They might have missed a, a complete area of a street. Uh, so, has there been any uh, has staff identified, or has uh, uh, the contractor acknowledged any error on its part? Well, th through you, Mr. Chair, first of all, we do have a, a new contract. Contract, yeah. We have a new contract for, for the City of Brampton, and it's going to last for seven years. This is the first year of a seven-year contract. Of that contract, there are individual contractors that are doing various things in various places of the city. So, so and those contractors, a lot of them have worked for the City of Brampton before. So, there, so you... So it's a new contract, but not necessarily all the components that are within that contract are, are new. Having said that, um, the contracting business, um, it's, it's, it's tough to, to get a consistent, I would say it's a, to get a consistent uh, quality of service. I mean, if you can imagine, uh, you, you're a contractor, say you've got 20 trucks that are working for the city of Brampton. That means you've got to have at least 40 people that are kind of staffed and ready to go at any moment. So if there's shifts so that the one can work half a day and the other guy can work half a day, uh, these people find other jobs because they're sitting around waiting for things. They're not like, like say, the fire department who get paid in between. So they may get paid something to, 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 to stay at home and be ready at any time, but not always. So, so it's, it's kind of a hit and miss. You may not get the same guy doing the same street every time. You might get the same truck, but not necessarily the same driver. So all of these things are, are the variables that are there. And Councillor, I don't know how to answer your question. I mean, I, you know, there, there are streets where we're hitting curbs and doing damage, and then there's other streets where we're staying a little bit too far away because it's out there. So. Uh, we do mop up after after a plowing event. Um, the good news is that normally, in a normal winter, we don't do any more than six or eight plowing events. Six to eight. Uh, other than that, we're treating the we're treating the uh, the streets with right. chemically treating it with salt. Right. So the the last thing I, the question I have is that um, you know when you call for Michelle, when when you call for example your internet's out and you call Rogers, 
uh, and they'll give a, a pre-recorded message even before mm -hmm. you reach an agent. Uh, do we have something uh, like that in place as well that it'll limit people actually getting to speaking to our agents? Right, through the chair, absolutely, yeah. So we actually invoked that um, during the last or the last snow event. So we do. What we do is every time we receive an, an update from the operating department, we change that upfront message. So that's the first thing residents hear. And that's put across all published lines that come into the contact center. So that's the first thing they hear. And it also directs them to the website, or to the snow page, where they can see the most up-to-date events right. as well. So yeah. the, la the very last thing is, uh, I guess everybody's heard about the, uh, I'm asking about if there's a system in place. I guess in Hawaii they had that, uh, uh, you know, that, mm -hmm. that thing where, uh, you know, the emergency response. Uh, where everybody got texted. Is there some type of uh, system we have or can have where somebody can uh, sign up to get a text about uh, snow updates, if that's possible? <laughs> yes. Or maybe like that'll come yeah. directly to them. Right. Uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair. I mean, we our significant events are are, uh, are given out to uh, uh, members of council, mayor, members of council, and, and all affected senior staff when we call a significant event. Um, I don't believe it's placed on the web, but I guess we can do that. And uh, that's, another, that's another thing for us, we can do that, that a significant event has been, uh, has been called and, and that we're dealing with a winter storm. Thanks, and, and just, just the last point is that I think uh, when you had mentioned that, uh, you know, we can have real-time updates as to where the plows are, I think that's really exciting, and I think that's good news for the residents. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Plashy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> building off of what uh, Councilor Dillon was saying, in, in terms of notifications, is there an opportunity for us to notify something like uh, CP24 just to get kind of one of their... Um, one something that we want to send out to their ticker to, to get it out there. Is that a possibility that they would even put that on there um, just as an, as an update for Brampton residents? Well, to you, Mr. Chair, that's something we can look at. It. We haven't been dealing with CP24. They're usually Toronto-based mostly, but, uh, but we can certainly <coughs> look into that. Okay. Um, and then is, is there, Joe, is there contractor staffing issues that that we seem to be having? Um, through, through you, Mr. Chair, when people are involved, there's always issues. So, <laughs> so I, uh, and we have over 200 pieces of equipment. So that's well over 200 operators. So this is a big operation. This, this isn't small time stuff. So, so sorry, Joe, just before you, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit confused because, so we have a contract are those our employees that are in those vehicles? Are those vehicles ours that go out and plow? And if there is a percentage, kind of what's that percentage? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the percentage of, of city staff doing winter works is about 15%. Okay. And the bulk of the work is done by contract, about 85%. Okay. So, and I know you, I realize that you, you know, you're saying we and we, and, but really it's the contractor. And... I, I think, and from what I've seen and from what I've heard, because I've compiled a list of, of, of uh, streets that have been affected in, uh, in my area, um, but our area, area Councillor Williams, um, but what I've even seen was uh, a plow going um, in front of my house down the street with the plow up, going to the end, turning around, coming back with the plow down, and only doing one of the street, one side of the street. And, and then that other half not getting done. I also see every time there's a, a storm, they they turn the corner of, they come up my street, but then go on to another street, they go on to Region View before finishing the rest of my street. And that's what I'm, what I'm constantly hearing. I'm hearing that there's plows that are going out there. They're doing streets, driving down streets with plows up to get to other streets that they're supposed to be doing, but just not having what I call that common sense. And I, and I don't understand why they why they're just not dropping the plow. Like it's it's, you know, I, I we're going through the same 
kind of a similar issue right now at the region with with waste management and, and our contract tour um, with that and so it's it's and I kind of put the two together and then going to you know 311 some of the issues that I'm hearing is we may be educating the people but we're educating them on the policy on a policy and, and that's you know and nobody wants to hear constantly what our policy is I don't feel like that's educating it's it's it, it's tough for a resident to call in they, they really want to be heard and then they want to see some action and with us just you know saying well this is our policy um, and I know that we're logging or we're saying we're logging but I'm also hearing people that have repeat calls mm -hmm. and that are explaining themselves all over again because there wasn't a log um, so I know that we're that I, and I know that we're doing we're doing a great job and, and mm -hmm. we're 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 playing the cards that we've been dealt um, this winter is a little bit different than previous winters we've we've had a significant amount of, of snow and then we've had this warm-up um, and then an instant freeze again which is you know, causing chaos with the ice rink that I'm trying to build but I'm just Joe I want to make sure and, and I just say it we have a, I think we have a contractor issue I don't think we have a, necessarily a city of Brampton issue. We have a contractor issue um, in providing the service that we need to be providing to to the residents. So some of the issues that I that I talked about, if if maybe we can look into them just to find out, you know, like passing by a street to get to another street, and I don't know what we um, what we call what types of streets we call um, because of their high, if there may be higher traffic than other ones, but it's just. Again, it's that common sense. I think we need a common sense policy. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So we'll certainly look into the specific issues that, 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 that you've uh, noted. But um, there is a bit of a science to the routing. And, and we set them up so that we can actually complete all the streets with the equipment we have within our specified, uh, with our, with, within our specified uh, period. So. <laughs> and not, not everybody's going to walk out of, drive out of the yard and then drop their plow. So when we have 100 vehicles coming out, like obviously there's only one that's going to do that, that's going to do it in front of the yard. <coughs> All the others go to where they have to go and then start their route. But that's they, not what I'm talking about, Joe. Yeah, so, so that's number one. Number two, um, th th most, in most cases, the plows are always set up so they do right turns. So they try and go around right turns around all the corners. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they'll just go down one side of the street, go down another, constantly making right turns, and then turn around and come back and do the other side. So that happens as well. Yeah. Uh, in your particular case, I, I really just can't answer it. No. We'd have to sit down and take a look who's assigned in that area and, and what the routing looks like. So. And I just gave mine as an example yeah. because yeah. I've heard it from other people on, on their streets as well. Where they're driving past their house when they, you know, homeowners getting out, and they're they're leaving their um, their street to get onto another street that's been plowed and then not plowed and then been plowed. Like it's just it's very it's 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 kind of a little bit weird. Do you believe that? Okay, so my last couple questions here is: Do we root the contractors? And do you believe that the contractors are providing a level of service to our residents that they, that we're that we should probably have within our contract? Well, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. First of all, we assign the routes, so we we determine what the routes are, and then contractor A with his 20 trucks will be given 20 routes, and not necessarily 20. Depends if they're doing things in tandem. Those 20 trucks might be doing 15 streets or 16 so, streets. Okay, so do, do we give that, sorry to cut you off, Joel, do we give an area or do we say this is the route? You have to go up Kennedy Road, you have to turn right on Regent View, you have to go down, like, or Conservation down Regent View. Like, do we say, do, do we get into that or is that the contract? We get into that. We do, eh? Yeah. Okay. So we get into that part. As far as quality of work, um, you know, and, and, and I guess I'm, I'm, it's subjective to me because I work for Brampton, but I think Brampton's got as good or better quality of, of, of uh, winter works than any other surrounding municipality. I believe that. Um, I mean, 
you look at Toronto, I don't think there's anything to really uh, brag about there. Mm -hmm. We're as good or better than, uh, than, than Mississauga. Uh, we don't have the type of winters that Caledon has, so they're out there. And that mo Caledon is mostly done by the region of Peel because yeah. they have mostly regional roads. But uh, they have a different kind of winter up there and a different kind of road system. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're really, really good, actually. That's my opinion. <laughs> but do we have a port performance level within our contract that the contractor is currently? As far as the performance of the contract, there's always room for improvement. It's almost like a hockey team. You know, even when you win the game, you sit there and go, well, you know, we could have been better on defense or better on offense. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with, 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 uh, with winter maintenance. And, you know, and I, was, and I was talking to other counselors earlier this week. No two storms are alike. I mean, is it a Colorado low? Is it, uh, you know, uh, an Alberta clipper? Is it something coming a stream off the lake? I mean, all these, the snow is different. Just the texture of the snow and the moisture content and the wind. And so just like there's no two snowflakes are alike, there's no two storms that are alike. So it, a lot of it's done by feel. And we're really fortunate that we have experienced staff to deal with it. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Coach Blessing. Councilor Fatini. Thank you, Joe. I know it's it's hard with the snow. It's not like grass. You don't cut it today. You cut it tomorrow. But the salt melts all storms at the end of the day. Um, who, the tree had salt. I know the tree had salt is used usually when it's over minus 20 degrees. It works. Who pays for that? Is it the city or is it, it goes through the contract? No, all salt is, uh, all the material is purchased by the city of Brampton. Okay. Uh, we determine what, what the contractor is going to use. We've been looking at uh, using more of the treated salt more and more and more and more in the residential area, and we're probably going to continue with that. Um, I know in Mississauga they use treated salt in the residential streets right off the bat, and the reason they do that is because the treated salt works quicker without the traffic, and that's why they put it in residential streets and they use straight salt on, co on collectors and, and arterials, and that's something that... Uh, that I've talked to Ken and Mike Parks about, and we're going to be looking at doing more of that here as well. Yeah. And the sand mix we use on the side streets, what is it, a 50 50, 40 60 mix? Uh, the last I looked, it was something like uh, 80 20 or 85 15. There's just enough salt in there to keep the sand from freezing. So, what, let's see, if we provide the salt, what do we pay about $40 a ton, $45 a ton? No, I believe it's more than that. I believe it's around 60 to $70 a ton now. A city? Yeah. Because I know these, uh, where you have the salt, $66 a ton. You attract the trailer. City so should pay a lot less. So, so, but the labor part, going through the side street, the sand mix, you know, if we put the salt, it actually, I know it's packed and it's hard and it becomes slush. It melts faster than the sand just sits there. Usually sand is used up north because... It's so over 30 degrees, salt doesn't work, so they put sand for traction. But on the side streets, I think if we use the treated salt, or the, and the treated salt's a lot more expensive, or regular salt, with the cars going over, as soon as it hits the sun, it, it kind of melts you. We don't really have to plow. We don't leave those wind droves in front of the driveways as much. Yeah, so, so the idea, through you, Mr. Chair, the idea with, with the sand is that on, on residential streets, once it's hard packed and it's yeah. snow and ice, the sand is put on top basically for traction. Sure. It's, not, it's not there to melt. It's not there to, to deal with what's there. It's basically to provide, make it safe and passable. Yeah. There's certain roads, I know, like to say we have that 15%, and this is why I know it's at night, and I'm out there. They don't follow the wingman. So they're driving. You're supposed to follow the wingman, and people are taking off on side streets. They're going on the, on the roads in certain areas where the boulevard is less than two feet. They're doing 60 kilometers an hour. That's snow because the, the plow only goes on faces on the right-hand side. It doesn't flip. And they're pushing the snow onto the sidewalk and you got three feet of, of snow onto the sidewalk because of the speed. The other night they came down Highway 10. They were splashing along the stores. The guy was doing 60 kilometers an hour at 3 o'clock in the morning. All the stores were being splashed. Because in the, so the speed has has to happen too because it, it causes a problem when it goes on the sidewalk. That guy can't go out there. So I just clean my sidewalks now. I got two feet. Those are some of the complaints I have. There's some other ones, roads in my area like Hercules, that's very steep. Very steep. You, 
and there's no sidewalks, so that, that zero lot lines there in the H section. Those are the roads we have to really maintain. I said it last year. I seen people trying to push their car up. Now I know the sand. We have to salt those roads because you get a road like mine, or you go know, these courts of Professor's Lake, and they're all nice and salt, and my road's nice and salt, and it's flat. But those ones are really dangerous. The other morning, people are pushing their car up the street. They can't get up. And I've been there many times, and I did send an email. They have a little bit of sand at the front, on the top where they turn. And the reason the top turns because when the truck turns, it's throwing lots out, so it's really putting it down on the hill. There's nothing there. So, you know, we, so I really, like, those streets are very important, you know, where it's, it's dangerous. Kids are walking on the street and they're not walking on the sidewalk. We've got to really look into those. Through you, Mr. Chair, you know, you, you heard the expression of hot spots. Well, yeah. we, we do have a list of cold spots yeah. and uh, for, for winter works, and, and they're usually bridge decks. They are uh, streets that are abnormally uh, steep <coughs> or curvy. And we do have an anti-icing program for them, so we actually pre-treat those streets. Now, I'm not saying our list is complete. Every year there seems to be something else that's added. Or so, so please, if there's something that anyone sees that, that's out of the ordinary, we'll certainly look at it and add it to our list, especially with our anti-icing program. And where the, one more, a couple more. Where the bus shelters are, those machines, is it under the same contract or a different contract? Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, there are 2, 000, around 2,500 bus stops in the city, and we clear, we clear them. Uh, we don't do the maintenance on the, on the big stops. That's something the transit provides, but uh, just in and around the general stops, we do that. Or the, through contract, uh, Public Works and Engineering does that. But it's uh, contracted machines, and they get paid by hour. It's not that they get a stand I know they get a standby, keeping the machine there, but they, and then they get paid by hour working. That's exactly right. And I found it really weird, like on a Wednesday, on a Wednesday night, we, we knew it was going to rain and be plus 10 the next day with rain. We got all these machines out there cleaning these bus shelters. You know? And I couldn't figure it out when it's already plus 5 degrees the next morning. It was going to be plus 10 with rain and all the snow disappeared. And there they are pushing a little bit of snow there. Like, you know. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, you know, that's... You know, Councillor Fertini, you bring up a good point. I mean, when you see when you see in the, in the weather forecast that the weather is going to go up, and you know it's going to melt, but right in the immediate time, it's a lot of times the, the ice and snow is still there, and so <laughs> you know that if you wait, it's going to be gone. But if somebody trips and falls or has a, a, an issue with it, I mean that's an issue too, and we have to deal with it. So, yeah, sometimes it looks a little funny, but. Uh, but we're, we're conscious of that, and we try not to overdo it, but that does happen. Okay, last question. So I know, like, the, the other day we got an email, sidewalks are being started at 4 a.m. in the morning. You know, it's pretty hard to clean the sidewalks in two hours before people go to work. And I was driving at 8 o'clock in the morning on Folkestone, and uh, on Clark there we got Finchgate, the schools, and kids are all walking on the road. I know it's still snowing, but it's better to walk in one inch of snow than five inches. Maybe, you know, we could get them out there a little better, especially the sidewalks, you know, people walking on the road. Through you, Mr. So, Chair, we've, we've done, we've, we understand that. And, and, you know, we're promoting active transportation, and, and, and every trip starts with a walk, and we get that. Um, and we've really, really boosted up in the last four years uh, our, our commitment to sidewalk maintenance. And, uh, and I guess that's something that we're going to have to look at again through another budget cycle, whether we should be boosting it even more. But it, it used to be that you'd, you'd do all the roads, and when all of that was done, then, then the guys would hop into the sidewalk machines and, and then do the sidewalks. Well, it's not like that anymore. We're trying to do it consecutively. Maybe we need even quicker response to the sidewalks. And as you mentioned, Councillor Fertini, sometimes, and Councillor Moore sent me a a little caricature the other day of a snow plow, you know, guy does the sidewalk and the snow plow covers it in and and, and that does happen. And and so we have to be cognizant of that and send out the sidewalk plow a second time to, to get it. There's no there's really no way to avoid it. Do you find these new machines that uh, these ninety horsepower machines are faster and easier to clean the sidewalks than the, the Kubotas and uh, John Deere V plow? Through you, Mr. Chair, I find that's a loaded question, but but yes, I do because I recommended those machines. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, 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 I, I, so the V plows, you know, remember I said we could cut the notch. I've noticed because it's hard for a driver to stay 
on the sidewalk when the plow is five feet there's a V plow and the sidewalk is five feet. It's impossible to be. But they're ripping up the lawns. Who repairs all these lawns at the end? Or damage boulevards? Uh, it depends. If it's uh, if it's just if it's deemed by us to be negligence by the contractor, we have the contractor pay for it. We repair it. Uh, the little bits that get done uh, along the way, uh, because like you say, it's difficult to see. Then the works department comes in and and, and we do it. We do the repair. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fertini. Perhaps next snowfall you can hop in a truck since you seem to be well versed in this and help the works department out. <laughs> Councillor Bunchales. Yeah, thank you through the chair. Yeah, and I agree that uh, the education that uh, Councillor Fertini provides is really detail oriented, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, uh, following up on some of the councillors' uh, question, I just uh, some assurance uh, that there is a performance management component of these contracts that you've contacted the contractors, there's been some discussions around some of the issues that staff have identified. Can I, can I just confirm that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, after every winter event, as uh, soon as things settle down, after the mop-up, when there's time to do it, we sit back and, and our staff review what went right, what went wrong, what can we do better. So, and. And if there's any contract issues, that's brought to the contractor's attention, and, and we expect a, an improvement in, in their performance. So, and so through the chair, I, I do understand this is a becomes almost like a fallacy, similar to the taxes that in the neighboring jurisdictions, it's sometimes always better. And having traveled to the neighboring jurisdictions or other municipalities, I didn't find uh, you know any better quality of service than we were receiving here. But I do understand that there was some. There's some confusion there, and um, just getting back to I guess the contractors. Um, when you're so, we do go through that sort of analysis after the event. Um, are there incentives for contractors to be competing? If we notice that there's a, I guess the ability to adjust. If we notice some contractors are performing better, that we will be able to adjust the level of service or the opportunity for the contractor to take on more work. Because my understanding, there's several. You said seven. Is that correct? Contractors. Uh, or is it a fine chair, set number? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't have the number with me, so I don't want to put sure. out a number, but, but it's a number of contracts. So this is a big city. So sometimes, you know, you just get uh, you get a storm in one part and not in another, or, or sure. just a few of the streets. And, yeah, I mean, if, if we want to send out uh, sidewalk plows, we can look at all of them and say, well, you know, that was your normal route, but... Uh, because you're doing such a good job, we can send you out to do this particular job. Not the whole city, but, sure. but a portion of. So, so we we have the ability to do that. We haven't done it yet okay. this winter, but. And and just lastly, that thing about the technology is excellent. I think because uh, um, that's one of the issues that you find with residents is just that that information and you know where where when is it coming to my street? You know what's happening and and that sort of opportunity that they can sort of see exactly what's happening, what plows are going. I think that's, uh, that's, that's amazing. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Mills. Councilman Fortini. Thank you, Quick question. This is more for myself. Yes. Are we going to be, so is it going to have shortage of salt this year, do you think, because of the way the weather's going? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that's a question that comes up every year. Uh, <laughs> the answer is we could. <laughs> I mean, if this keeps up, uh, so far, they've been supplying us. Uh, they've been they've been doing a good job. Uh, a lot of it. Let's face it. When we need salt, Toronto needs salt. Mississauga. Yeah. Need, everybody does. But they've tried to apportion uh, when when a ship comes in and, and dispenses it at the at the at the shipyards in Toronto. Uh, whatever they get, they know who their customers are, and and we're all we're all getting it basically from the same supplier. So. Uh, they do a pretty good job in making sure that no one really runs out. We've had worse winters than this, and uh, we've had just-in-time delivery, but uh, but we've never run out. Because I remember about six, seven years ago, we couldn't get salt because they had to supply all the cities. So I'm almost out, so that's why I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, can I have, uh, ask the chair be heard? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Michelle, for coming. Uh, and just a little funny little story. I'm uh, glad we have 301 because... A number of years ago, my father was sitting on Christmas Day, I was with him, he got a phone call about getting the street cleared. That was the mayor back then, he got called and his response was, when they get to my street, I'll send them over. <laughs>
<laughs> and, th and thank you, Ken, for the good work you guys did. I know we had a lot of issues. I, I got some emails on Christmas Day and Boxing Day, and I was, I was out of town, but you were able to clear it up, and we were, the residents did thank us, and they, they did thank us for clarifying the situations up. So thanks again very much. Uh, Councillor, no. Councillor Gibson, could you like to move for seat of the, thank you. All in favor? Thank you very much. I think that's the end of the reports. So now we, oh, is there any council question please you can ask? No, 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 this is a question, Joe? The park cars on the road that they leave. Sorry, Joe. The park cars that I know is when you go around the roads, people are leaving park cars and plows are going around them. That's fine. But there's certain roads where the plow cannot fit, and then we have to call another truck because a truck driver cannot back it up. And they just give a ticket to the car. How can we get them told? Yeah, that's what I was ask. Because there's a lot of roads where the plow cannot fit, and they're not allowed to back up by law in case someone gets hurt. Through you, Mr. Chair, we do and we do work with uh, by law enforcement, and we do get them to toast in certain situations. Uh, if we can get around them, we usually do, and then come back and do a mop up. But if a situation like you described happens where the truck gets stuck. Uh, we're on the radio right away, and we've had really good service with uh, with bylaw enforcement. So, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Councillor Farina. That was a good point. Okay, we are now at the end of the public works, and I'm going to turn it over now to Councillor Pleshi. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome everybody to the community services section. Uh, we have no staff presentations. First item is uh, a report 7.2.1, a report from uh, Commissioner of Community Services, update to authority to modernize, mandate, revised real estate acquisition, disposal and leasing strategy, parks, recreation, transit and other required land acquisitions to build out. Are there any questions on this? Seeing none, anyone want to move it? Councillor Moore, all in favor? All in favor? That carries. Next item uh, from Director of Recreation Community Services, update to MOU for proposed partnership with the Peel District School Board, shared use or artificial turf sports field at Jean, Jean Augustin uh, Secondary School. Any questions on this? Mayor Jeffrey. Question, Mr. Chair, but something that I mentioned in the pre-brief that I got the other uh, yesterday on this particular item. I think we're doing a lot of good work with the school boards, and I just want us to make sure that we start uh, telling that positive story. There are some good, positive working relationships with uh, our uh, partners in the school board, and I, I just I think it's a win-win. I just want to make sure that we talk about it and we keep telling those stories. I know there's more reports coming forward in the future. But I think uh, it's good to tell the stories as they happen as well because I think it takes a lot of effort on behalf of our staff to make this work and we haven't always had such a positive working relationship. So it, I think staff has, has said that they will do that and I just wanted to bring that to attention that they're going to do something that will help bring some good stories to the city. For sure. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilor Miles. I agree with the Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilor Miles. Councilor Willens. I agree with the mayor as well, but um, it's good. I'm glad you brought it up, Madam Mayor, because I had a discussion with uh, the Associations Across Club last week, and uh, Zenny Lipinski, as you know, he's the caretaker up at Mayfield, and the Mayfield uh, principal up there is very proactive for sports, and they're looking at redesigning their whole sports fields, putting some astroturf in there, and that would definitely help that northeastern community as well as far as sports field shortage. So that's all I want to say. Mayor? Mayfield? Secondary school? It's not in Brampton. So the Excelsiors are going to Cal? No. Oh. 
<laughs> Thank you, Councillor Willens. And I know that this council has talked about a better relationship with the school boards, and I think this is a great step in, um, in doing that. Count Mayor um, Jeffrey, will you move the uh, report? All in favor? That carries. Uh, item 7.2.3 has been dealt with. Item 7.2.4 was pulled out of consent by myself. Um, and then the question that I had on this was uh, with regards to the electrified buses pilot project um, and a possible update on that because the update that we heard I think last time wasn't, um, wasn't a good update. We were wondering, and I'll start off with that question, if you can. Absolutely, uh, your chairmanship. The uh, the electric pilot bus project, um, we've been working with the Ministry of Transportation along with QTRIC on finalizing some details in terms of the funding model. Uh, the province has uh, indicated um, that there will be an announcement very shortly. Uh, I know we have been waiting for some time for that. Uh, there's been some details that we've been trying to work out with um, uh, with a part of that that we're using PTIF money uh, for, which is the federal government money, and how that um, will play a role. The good news is in, with the electric pilot program, our biggest issue uh, with the time restraints were around the PTIF uh, timelines. Um, Minister Sohi indicated now that they've extended the timeline, so we're no longer constrained with, um, with that, which was a really pressing thing for Brampton. So we are very optimistic. We're just waiting for the province of Ontario through the MTO uh, to come up with that. Uh, announcement okay um, that's good um, with this contract I just wanted to make sure that we um, I realize that it's diesel buses and it does have um, in the current situation it does uh, talk about uh, one the pilot project and any electric buses I really want us to be able to look at you know electrifying our bus fleet so if we can always keep that in mind in terms of whenever we're buying a bus, if there's an opportunity to electrify uh, our next bus or, or anything like that, I always want that to be kind of the front and center. I envision Brampton to have an electrified fleet. Um, and so I just, I want, I don't want, I know it, I realize it doesn't handcuff us to just diesel buses, but I just want to make sure that that's front and center whenever we go to choose um, and, uh, a route or, or, or purchasing a new bus. Yeah. And to the chair, it's a very good point. Uh, through this process, we've actually been working and doing a maintenance review this year, a significant one, and looking how we can actually uh, smoothen out our replacement and growth buses over the course of the next 10 years. One of them is factoring in uh, slowing down the initial purchases to see if we can broaden it down to approximately 60 to 70 vehicles with replacement and growth uh, and looking at what is electric technology coming in the next couple of years because you're right um, if we have an opportunity to in year three or four to shift that around we want to be able to do that and come back to council um, for approvals for that so absolutely we're keeping a very close eye we're really excited about the electric bus pilot and how that's going to yield uh, an outcome for in a positive way absolutely. excellent okay thank you um Mayor Jeffrey. So, Chair, I just want to say thank you for withdrawing this because I think this is another good news story. This is um, 95 buses. And I think for anybody who read TBO is the secret behind Brampton's transit success, it's investment, getting better customer service, uh, newer equipment. And when you look at how much our ridership has grown, I think last year between January and October it was like 19% growth. That isn't just in a comparator to our population growth. We're getting more people believing and riding and finding it convenient to take public transit. So this is a very good news story, but it is also contingent on us continuing to replace those obsolete retired buses, and it will be something that we need to approve in our capital budgets going forward. So. I think it's a good news story, and I, I want us to continue that, and I appreciate TBO giving us a high five and, and um, saying that we are doing something unique and uh, important and uh, valuable. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, staff. Mayor Jeffrey, you move the report. All in favor? Carries. The next item was uh, something that was added by Councillor Willens, 7.3.2, on the bylaw, Councillor Willens. 
Yeah, it's more to, uh, for Al, um, maybe we could come, come back. I uh, don't want to have a discussion now, but maybe bring a report back on updating our dog bylaw and perhaps looking at specifically the keeping of animals, uh, the leashing and tethering, the animals in, in vehicles. We don't even have that in our bylaw. And the animal enclosures, and maybe reference that to the SPCA guidelines. Because we are getting a number of calls from dogs being left out in this inclement weather. I know Mississauga has has uh, brought something in about bringing the dogs in in a four hour and a 24 hour period or something on a tether. So maybe if we could bring something back and have a discussion around council on that at a later date. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion on the direction to staff? Seeing none. Um, council, it was a motion? Oh, you need a motion. Everybody okay with that? All in favor? That carries. Uh, council question period. Any members of council? Mayor Jeffrey. So oh, I know I have to put this in the form of a question. So my question is, <clears throat> do we have a protocol when there is a an weather event? And the reason I ask the question the way I am is that for New Year's, uh, there appeared to be a little bit of confusion as to what was happening with our New Year's Day event based on what was happening across Ontario, whether it was in Ottawa or Toronto or Mississauga. And there appeared to be a number of different departments that were working to manage the event, and this is not a complaint about the event. I'm not sure we have a protocol. So my question is, I, I think we don't have a protocol. Could we work on a protocol and debrief about what happened? Because we are going to get other weather events that relate to whether it's New Year's or uh, Canada Day or something else that I think we have economic development and transit and um, emergency measures who all need to kind of work together. And I'm, I actually don't think we have a, a protocol. So I'm asking, could staff look at that and could they get back to us so that we don't seem to be, because uh, I didn't have the information and I was doing the event. So I think we can do a better job of communicating to council because often when you're out in the public, people are asking you. So I would just want to make sure we're just a little better prepared. And it looks like Mr. Schlang has a comment. Yeah, for sure, Madam Mayor. And usually we get a, a report back from staff on how the um, uh, New Year's Eve went. And is it possible to tag on to that, three, that report coming Three back? chair, right? Very yeah. sure. Three chair, I'll take that, you know, because it crosses multiple divisions. So I'll yeah. take that. I know that we worked with emergency services, it seemed fine, and then we retracted from that. So I, I will take that back. It was moving, so I, I appreciate yeah. that staff will work on it, just so the council is better uh, prepared next year. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Council Moss. Um, my question is actually to do with economic development, but we've already dealt with the report in economic development. Well, there'll, be come back? there'll be question period in ECTEV. So let's move on to ECTEF. <laughs> Seeing no other questions. Thank you. No. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome to the economic development section. Uh, we already dealt with 8.1.1 uh, uh, this morning. Um, there are no reports. Uh, Councillor Gibson did add uh, 8.3.1 an item, so uh, Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to just ask this as a question, but I think you're probably better off that it was um, on its discussion anyway. At the Region Appeal, um, the last meeting, we directed, Councillor Carlson actually brought it up, and um, I, I spoke about some of the events in Brampton. There's been a change in the police policy for events and how they charge for the events and how many police officers need to be at events and such and such. Um, I don't think any of us understand exactly what all those policy changes are precisely, but we, at the region we um, asked staff or directed staff to work with the municipalities and work with um, the people that put on these events. They're not all put on by the municipalities, some of them are private events and work with the police to try to find out what these uh, new policies mean in terms of the cost for the events. Um, George brought up one incident uh, where his event, uh, they've determined that it's an extra $47,000 uh, in policing for that event, and he basically said that kills the event, event will be stopped if they have to put that out. 
So the reason we've asked the regional staff to work with, with all this, with the municipalities and events, to try to come up with something that we could help, at least for this year, get through this, so that events <coughs> just aren't cancelled. Yesterday I spoke to Susie from the downtown BIA and asked her if she could try to uh, determine what events they do and how that would affect, but we still don't know what the policy change precisely was. So my intent was to ask staff whether or not they knew, and I know uh, talking to um, Mr. Jarling yesterday, Mr. Jarling <coughs> has done so, a little bit of homework for us and, and got some um, details for us today, but I, I still don't think we know all the details of it. We might have to direct staff to work with the Region Appeal, work with these events, try to find out what each event, what the needs are. There's some different needs, whether alcohol is supplied and all that kind of stuff. So maybe I'll just shut up and let Mr. Darling <laughs> follow up on what I'm saying. So thank you, thank you, Councillor Gibson. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. You're absolutely right. So we were, we were contacted last week uh, and uh, verbally given the new update from Peel Regional Police. So the, uh, the affected uh, cities or region is Region of Peel, City of Brampton, and City of Mississauga. Um, the uh, police will uh, waive the administration fee, which is 17%, and also waive the vehicle fee, which is $36 an hour. Um, but you, as you said, you can't uh, be serving alcohol, and we can't generate any revenue from the event. So, for, and it, so none of our community grant programs can, be, uh, can benefit from this. Uh, the BIA couldn't benefit from this. Outside agency like the Honey Festival in, in Streetsville couldn't benefit. Our tree lighting is uh, is a good example that we do benefit from it. Uh, New Year's Eve we benefit from it, but it's a savings of about seven hundred, eight hundred dollars uh, on a five thousand dollar police budget. Hometown hockey will benefit from it. Uh, Remembrance Day, the police waive all fees, but our Celebrampton and our Canada Day events are are not eligible because we generate revenue by having. Uh, vendors at the event. So that's the new policy. Um, and, and an example is hometown hockey. We're bringing a report to you next week. It will, uh, the, the police fees for that event is roughly around $35,000. Okay. So, uh, that's so that's on, on, on how it affects the municipality. According to, uh, and we don't know what the effects are on uh, things like where the BIA put on or another organization puts on. And according to a uh, um, counselor from Mississauga, um, it's a huge cost for them. We get the 17%, but they don't. And my understanding is our, we know from uh, those of us who sat on the board of directors of the BIA that their costs for their events last year went up. And But from my understanding of this, their cost now for this year is, is going to be dramatically changed for that. And I don't mean this to sound like it's a knock on the police for changing their policies because... Every, as I, I, I got interviewed on this by a reporter from Mississauga the other day, and as I said to him, and I don't know what he's, he's reported out, but what I, I said to him was every, every cent needs to be accounted for, and I think that's what the police are trying to do. Instead of what was happening before where the police would provide freebies, they would, they would just send officers out, there wouldn't be a cost for these things. Now they're attributing a cost to um, everything. Having said that, there ha that cost has to now be determined on who's going to pay for it and how. Because for us, as a big municipality, you know, we can go back and, and, and use taxation to run events that we think are important to run. But for an organization, for private organizations out there or for like BIAs, they just can't afford it. Like, as George had said at the region, a $47,000 increase or, or just the cost to, I think that was a honey festival, the honey parade, I don't know what it is down there, kills it. That's it. It's done. There's no event. They, they just they can't do it. So I, we need to somehow work with the Region Appeal, uh, policing and Region Appeal, to try to, and, and the BIAs and all those other groups to try to get a determination of what this really means. And, if there's, and, and then determine, as we are doing it at a city level, determining what events are important to us and try to get a handle on this and try to help them at least get through this year so we can figure this out. Because, you know, as I said to the reporter, these events are very important, and, and the police acknowledge that they're very important because they bring communities together. You know, they get people talking. They, they, they bring the communities together, and policing knows that how important that is, and so do we. So I guess out of all that, I just want to maybe give direction to staff to uh, do what I just said, work with the region, work with the events, try to get a handle on what the policy means, not just to us, 
but to those outside organizations too. Thank you. Sorry for the red. Oh, thank you, Councillor Gibson. Councillor Maderos. Uh, through the chair, just just to follow up, and I think in practical terms, um, you know, I've been working with the police on trying to reduce costs for our Lady Fatima Church uh, over there on Malta. They do a big procession and uh, they raise funds that goes back into helping the church. Um, and also it brings in people from all different provinces that come over. Um, so one of, one of the issues it does have is that you, you handcuff, I guess, an organization that's trying to fundraise, and at the same time then, you know, this happens. So this is a, something that, um, you know, we do uh, want to monitor, and, and I'm not sure if uh, in the future, I guess the grants program, if the, there'd be some opportunity there to look at and revisit um, maybe including security costs or something along those lines where there's some economic benefit. Um, but just trying to think out of the box, those type of things. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maderos. Uh, Councillor Gibson, did you want to move a motion to have this officially looked at? Because uh, with Councillor Maderos also asking to see if we can look at the grant program, that's going to have to be changed. So I think we need a motion, Peter, to refer it back to staff for a report. Okay, would you like to move that, Councillor Gibson? Okay, thank you very much. All in favor? That carries. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, thank you very much, by the way. Um, 8.4, we have no correspondence. 8.5, Councillor, question period. Uh, Councillor Maderos, are you still on, uh, on the board? Ask a question. Okay, and yes. Councillor Miles, you wanted to go on the board, so Councillor Maderos? I'll let Councillor Miles go first, since you had. Sure. You were on the board before. So. Thank you. Um, so during the last uh, during the last week, uh, myself and members of council have been getting a lot of correspondence from the Brampton Music Theatre Group, who um, have had space at Arenda Road uh, for quite a period of time, and also before that they were at Greenbrier Recreation Centre. And uh, thank you, Bob, for the briefing note. I think that was that was really helpful. My concern is that the City of Brampton recognizes the really important role that arts and culture have in our community. That's why we've been doing so much work in the last, uh, through this whole term of council actually, to try and come up with a arts and culture master plan. And I do recognize also that, there's a question in here somewhere, <laughs> I do recognize also that um, that we have to be fair and equitable, and that's important. The problem comes when we try and take something away. We we saw that with Beaux Arts and Beaux Arts when they thought they were going to lose their space, came to council, and they made um, they made some really good valid points to council about why we shouldn't be taking the space away from them and their contribution to the community. Can't argue with that. I think with the Brampton Music Theatre as well, they are an amazing organization that involves all kinds of youth in the community, really positive benefit, and put on some pretty amazing shows. So the question is, is that we're on the cusp of uh, of, a, of an arts and culture master plan. And I somehow I don't think that it's the right thing for us to be doing to, to displacing these, these arts and cultural groups before we actually have answers to give to them. So they're going to come in front of us, I think, before the end of the month, and they're going to make some really compelling arguments about why they... They shouldn't be moved from their space. I don't want us to um, to not be able to respond to them. So that's why I'm, I'm raising it now. We don't have the answers until we have the Arts and Culture Master Plan. And we haven't figured out how we're going to deal with with the many amazing theater groups and arts groups that we have working in our in our community they're important to us and we want them to know that they're important to us but we want all the groups to know that they're important to us not just one so my my question really is is that how 
we need to be able to deal with this in a way that we're not throwing people <coughs> okay I'm not going to say throwing people asking people to leave their premises before we actually have a solution for them as to where where they're going to go and I think that was we saw that with Beaux Arts and then they come to council and council says oh no we're not you know and then we're going to the theater groups are going to come here and how are we going to respond to them if we don't have the answers so I would like us to have as a council, some discussion about this before they come in front of us and we, and we don't have the kind of response that, that they're going to be looking for. And so that's why I'm, I'm raising it today. I'm raising it prior to their com coming so that we can work collectively, I think, th with the different departments. I know there's there's, there's a, this is sort of a cross-departmental issue because it deals with property, deals with arts and culture, it deals with recreation, and, um, and I feel for them. Right? They, they are a pretty amazing group that does a lot of really good work with our youth in the community. And, I mean, that's the kind of thing we want. We, we want to engage our youth in positive ways, but... This organization is probably 50 years old, too. So it, uh, you know, you want to deal with them respectfully. And I'm not saying that we, that we haven't. I'm just saying let's take a look at some of these decisions that we make and the implications until we have an answer for them rather than, than moving forward and saying, well, we're going to try and deal with it. So. Mr. Darling. Uh, yes, uh, through the chair. The, um, we, we in uh, uh, cultural services agree 100% with your with your comments that we want to take care of our groups. The challenge that we have in this particular group uh, that will be coming maybe next week is what they're looking for. They they build a lot of their sets. They need high ceilings, <laughs> and uh, so we've we've asked them. You know, what specifically can we do for you? What couple of space and. And through uh, Al's group and our group in real estate, we've gone out and looked at sites outside of the city um, to rent for them. Um, and this is something that we can bring back as a suggestion to council. But it's this particular group has a, a, a large demand on, us, on stuff that we don't own as a city. So the other groups in there, we do have lots of space uh, in different spaces around the city that we can accommodate. Um, so that's the one point on this specific group. We just, we've asked them what they want and they want exactly what they have there. And that's been very challenging for us to work with. So on the second point about fair and equitable, this is the other challenge you have. There's a few groups in our city that have been getting free, uh, or free actually, free uh, rent for, for many, many, many years. And we have other groups in our city, now that we've launched this cultural master plan, that are coming out and asking, how do I get that particular deal? And this has been quite challenging for our group, and we've had some tough conversations, and, and there's going to be some more tough conversations, I said to you in that briefing note. So what we're trying to be, and many other cities do, is an application process, similar to the grant program. And when we changed the grant program this year, it was based on what you're doing for the community, how you're giving back to the community, and how you're impacting the community. So this is what we would be putting in this potential application once we have, and as you, as you correctly say, we don't have the, uh, the first ever uh, cultural master plan until June of this year. Uh, we're coming to council next our ne committee next week to give you an update on it, and then we're actually launching all February to go out to the community to get their response. Um, but you're absolutely right. The concern and the challenges that we lose sleep on is what do we do with these groups in the meantime? Okay. So we feel for you, feel for them. It's challenging. You know, they're 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 all sort of coming together. But so so is the other side of groups that are. There, they may, there may be some groups coming next week or two weeks from now that will say, how do I get that as well for you, as Beaux Arts has done. And so that's the challenge we're facing right now, and we completely understand that and respect that. It's just, you know, Al and I are working closely on the, on the next steps and um, hopefully have some solutions. Okay, well, th thank you very much. And um, again, I think... So your question... Councillor Miles is. Uh, my question is, is that. My question is, is that we we really need to. Um, it's hard for me to put this in a question, but I I do recognize it. But I don't want this group to come in front of us and us not have a solution or not have an answer for them. So, my question, I guess, is is, you know, what are we going to say? They're going to come and we're going to receive them. So, anyway, 
Um, I, I'll have further conversation with you about this offline, but I, I do want to raise it. I wanted to raise it today prior to, because I think we have to we have to be prepared as a municipality to answer those questions. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miles. Good point, Councillor Medeiros. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, just uh, looking for an update when we expect. There was supposed to be a report on, I guess, twinning cities or friendship cities. Do you have a timeline? Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, through the chair. Uh, we hopefully have it uh, within the next two or three weeks. I've, I've been just um, working on a couple of things, and maybe offline I'll have a couple of conversations because I know this is dear to your heart. So um, I'm trying to work this out, uh, how it fits into our new economic development section too, so, um, and also understanding and respecting our time of our staff. So I, I'd like to get your thoughts on it, and I will also do the same with the mayor who deals with this in delegation. So I have the report done in draft. Um, I'm close. I'm just, uh, I need a couple of tweaks I need to do, so very shortly, hopefully yeah. within the next two committees for sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Medeiros. Councillor Moore. Well, I'm going to have the same challenge of trying to put this in the form of a question. Um, <clears throat> and just to follow up on the issue that Councillor Miles has raised, first of all, as a member of council, to get the emails about the Brampton Music Theatre being over at Aranda Road, uh, I was not aware that they were there until fairly, I'm going to say within the past year. I, I weren't even aware that they were there. I don't recall that it was ever reported. None of you, don't, don't, you, you don't need to look guilty. <laughs> because I think they were there before any of you were in the, in the roles that you are in today. But first of all, I don't know who is at Arenda Road. I don't know whether it's just Brampton Music Theatre. I don't recall it ever being reported to this council. So we're getting emails saying you're throwing us out. So, or, you know, we've given you a year's notice. So I don't know who's there. I don't know what the arrangement is. I don't know how it happened that they are there. I don't know uh, any of that stuff. I mean, Beaux-Arts was pretty obvious. It came to this council. They're on Main Street. We know that we have um, been providing them, you know, pretty much rent-free for the past 15 years. Uh, but I think the issue of equity um, is coming up. And although it's just coming up around here and it's sort of, you know, bubbling to the surface, I'll bet you it's been bubbling in the arts community for a long time. Why do they get something and I don't get it? And if you're allowing them to build capacity, then, uh, you know, what opportunities are you giving me or us as a group to build capacity? So we've got uh, an issue that, you know, it, it really is quickly becoming the elephant in the room and we're going to have to start having some serious conversations about that. The other issue is that, you know, we can talk about a real estate uh, acquisition and disposal strategy, but there is a collision now, and we're seeing what that collision is. When you don't know about groups that are there formally, informally, whatever that agreement is, and now we're making a decision, you know, for a piece of, piece of property strategically placed in an employment area of this city that's worth millions of dollars to the taxpayers, how do we, you know, we just can't afford to sit on it and let people sit, be, stay in there for free rent unless we open that up to a whole lot more people and say, okay, that's where we're going to house and provide a campus kind of setting for the arts community. So we need to get our heads around, how do we go from where we are today with groups who are benefiting to, um, to the Arts and Culture Master Plan? How do we bridge it? What's the transition look like? And what's the transition look like? Because the Arts and Culture Master Plan is going to map things out for us. But how then are we going to transition to that destination? So there's some gaps in time. And, and gaps in our ability to provide the infrastructure to, to help these groups through. But I want to be really clear. It has to be more than just the groups that are there. We know the agree agreement we have with Beaux-Arts and uh, at uh, 55 Queen Street um, with the concert band and so on. But that causes a whole lot of discontent within that sector. And now, you know, there's, there's, I hear there's three or four groups. Brampton Music Theatre is the only one I'm aware of, and only, like I said, in the past year over on Arenda Road. But they, we just can't afford to have them sitting in a million, millions of dollars worth of asset to the taxpayers in the region, in, in the city of Brampton, and not benefit more people. So it's a tough conversation that we're going to have to have. 
But we have to have the conversation about addressing this. Um, I asked during the budget deliberations, how much are we supporting the arts? We've got a member of our community who's out there doing some calculations saying all we owe, all we're investing in the arts is $100,000 and you mo divide that by Brampton's population and 17 cents per capita. Well, it's more than $100,000. It's probably closer to $10 million and maybe more when you add our operating dollars with the capital investment just that we're making at Lester B. Pearson this year. It's a whole lot more than 17 cents per capita. We can't allow those kind of messages to continue to perpetuate, or perpetuate throughout their community because they just are not true. So, anyways, that's my rant. So, so my, if I'm going to put it in the form of a question, could staff please report back and address those issues? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> because I don't think we have to have an answer on January the 31st. I think staff need more time between now and January 31st to compile all of the information that you need. But you know, I, I would hope on the 31st uh, that we refer it back to staff and give them that opportunity to to address it. But um, like I said, this this is the elephant in the room today, and uh, it's got to be uh, dealt with with facts, not with speculation, not with people who choose to pull their own numbers out of a hat when those numbers are not correct. It's really troublesome, to be honest. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Moore. I see no further questions. So we will uh, we will move on. There's no staff, uh, Councillor. So we will move to Councillor Miles, and uh, you can take the chair. And actually, members of uh, items, I believe, were in consent, other than other than correspondence from Charles De Sousa regarding legalization of cannabis. Any questions on that item? Could we have a motion to receive the item? Moved by Councillor Medeiros. All in favor? That's carried. And now we're on to question period. Are, we, are there any questions then on corporate services? Councillor Fertini. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is still Commissioner Joe. Uh, are we looking into that Airbnb? Through the chair, yes, uh, working with enforcement and bylaw services to assess Airbnb and the implications on Brampton as part we, of our work plan this year. Do we know, uh, Hopefully within the, by Q2, we can come to, to you with something maybe earlier. That long, huh? Pardon? That long? <laughs> uh, we have to look at the, ram uh, through the chair, we have to look at the ramifications, implications at, uh, with respect to other municipalities and how much of an, an impact or the consequences in relation to the city of Brampton. Uh, but it's something we are working on right away. Well, so Toronto already kind of passed the bylaw and stuff, right? So it's not, you know, we can actually look at them and see on a two-month rental or something. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, under government relations matter matters, we do have a briefing report. Um, from Lowell, any questions on the briefing report? I did want Lowell to present something okay. on there. If that's okay, Council. Sorry, yes, I know it's close certainly. to lunch, but there's certainly. a, there's Lowell, a would pressing you like item. To yeah. Come down. Thank you very much, and to you, Chair. Happy New Year. Um, what Harry wanted me to talk about, and I'm only going to uh, touch on this one, is um, if you'll recall during one of the last uh, government relations update, we provided that the government has now released further details on the DC rebate program. So staff has now received further information. We're working with municipal affairs to under, better understand how the uh, the city can participate in this program. Uh, one of the key elements for us is to ensure that the Region Appeal has a role as a service manager. We feel that uh, there is a big role that the Region Appeal can play. Um, so right now we're really looking potentially to have offline conversations with what their role can be. And at some point we may have to be engaging um, our counselors to kind of push them a little bit. Um, so we're still kind of refining the details. There is a team that's working behind this from across, uh, from all departments. So I think we have uh, 
a really good opportunity to get this, this program up in place because as we all know affordable housing is not just a need in Peel, it's a need in Brampton um, and I think we have an opportunity especially with our low vacancy rates. So in the interest of time I'll just keep it to that one particular issue. The note also touch, provides a little bit of an update on cannabis as well as work that we're doing on our uh, pre-budget submissions that we're hoping to have a draft to you by, by next week. So with that I'll leave it to that and happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mayor Jeffrey. Thank you, uh, Lowell. I think uh, every month you come, things are happening. It's, I don't know if it's you or if it's just the world that uh, is happening around us. So I, I guess I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge today there was a shuffle. And for the second time, a female MPP from Brampton Springdale has made it into Cabinet. So that, to me, is yes. Uh, and I think that we also don't have a lot of time with this new Cabinet to make sure that our priorities remain in their next budget, it's 141 days. Mm -hmm. And we have a new Minister of Transportation, and we have a new Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Those are two issues that really matter to the City of Brampton. So we need to immediately reach out to these people who are now drinking from a fire hose to try and make sure <laughs> that they understand that their priority needs to be what Brampton's priorities are. So. Um, I'm happy to help with that. We like, write letters of congratulations, but we obviously need them to stay the course on things like the university and, and on transit investment for our city. So um, if you can make sure that happens, and I'm happy to have my office to help you do that and encourage them in the, the time left before the election to, to make sure that all their budgetary decisions are following the same track they've been on before. Thank, Thank you, Chief Chair, to uh, the Madam Mayor, absolutely. And um, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but this is one of the benefits of going to AMO. So some of the ministers who we did meet with AMO, so Catherine McGarry, who is now the minister, well, once she gets sworn in, will become the Minister of Transportation. I think it's official. I saw a tweet, so I think it's this, done yeah, now. it's official now. Well, I go by when they get sworn in, but... Um, you know, the relationships that we built at that AMO conference, you know, again, just really helps us. So I agree that we need to um, strike while the iron's hot and we don't have much time, so thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions then? No? Thank you very much, Lowell, for your report. I'll take a motion to receive. Moved by Mayor Jeffrey. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Then we'll move on to question period. Are there any questions? No questions. Uh, I'll pass it. I think that's the end of the agenda. Through you, Madam Chair, we have to uh, move a motion under item 13 to go into closed session. Okay. There are three closed session items. But I don't know if the committee wishes to take a lunch break before and then maybe perhaps reconvene um, after an appropriate break for lunch to deal with closed session in the sixth floor. But we have to pass a motion first okay. to recess and to go into closed session for the three items that are listed on the screen. So I'll take a motion then for us to um, move into closed session at... 1245, 1245, to deal with um, the issues that are before you. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you.